I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 29th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. This evening, we have our student member of the board, Mr. Mahamza, to lead us in the pledge. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. I pledge. I invite you to rise and return to the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a. Can you hear me? I can hear yes, you. Yes, Jim. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or board committee meetings be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting, despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's board meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding the motion as applicable, as well as when request requesting discussion on an agenda item. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the September 29, 2020 agenda. Uh, Dr. Williams, are there additions or changes to the agenda? So good evening, uh, Board Chair Causing Board members. There's one change, the removal of letter E, new business administrative appointments at 640 to 650. Board members, may I have a motion to exclude uh, the agenda item per uh, Dr. Williams' suggestion? So moved, Mac. Second. Second. Ms. Gover, you have the second. Yes. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hedger? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Ms. Fetcher? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Ms. Jones? Oh, good. Mr. McMillian? Yeah. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Jones? Uh, yes, I don't know why sorry, I was on mute. Thank you. Today, I ask that everybody mute their telephones and their oh, um, sorry, devices. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Uh, the motion carries. So, in accordance with board policy 8314, um, we have uh, amended the meeting by removing that item. So, the uh, revised agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons.
to one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is new business personnel matters and for that we call forward Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, ethics review panel appointment, and recognition of deceased. Board members, is there any comments or discussion? Hearing none, may I have a motion to accept the personnel items D1 through D3. So, so moved, moved to my second, second Offerman. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Causey, it's D1 through D4. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Uh, may I have a motion to approve items D1 through D4? So moved, Mac. Thank you. And second? Offerman. Thank you. Ms. Gover, roll call vote, please. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Gosher? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Starting with tonight's meeting, the Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. And I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired. The call will be ended and could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education. If not selected, the public may always submit their comments to the board members via email at boebcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at www.bcps.org 
slash board slash participation. I will now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak. Once stakeholder group speakers are done, then we will call on the individuals registered to address them. Ms. Cozzi, if, yes. if I may, could I please ask those that are on the call to, if they're watching the live stream, to turn their live stream down because we're getting that feedback. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Uh, our first um, stakeholder for the evening is Ms. Cindy Sexton, President of the Teachers Association of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Cozzi, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I speak mm -hmm. tonight on... I speak tonight on behalf of the five bargaining units in BCPS. Like you, we have fielded countless emails from our members and the community. There is great concern being raised over going back into the buildings and great concern being raised over not going back into the buildings. There have been hundreds of questions around safety, schedules, timelines, PPE, the medical fragility of students, staff who are at high risk, and a plethora of other things. We all know that at some point, our students will need to go back to a physical building and our staff will need to return to. We support a safe, sustained reopening. We ask, as we have done and will continue to do, for clear, consistent communication around this with our voices at the table when plans are being developed. As all reopening facets affect the working conditions of each of our associations, we need to continue to be part of the planning. All that being said, we are part of the design team and the COVID task force. And as such, we are now at the table as these plans are made. Additionally, Dr. Scriven, Dr. Adams, and Mr. Burke are available for us to reach out when there is a concern that needs immediate attention. We also meet regularly with them, and that is invaluable to take immediate action when it is needed or obtain clarification or just talk through whatever is popping up. Thank you, Dr. Scriven, Dr. Adams, and Mr. Burke. Information can and does change rapidly, and you are there with us as we all face the challenges and opportunities. Please continue to provide the clear, consistent communication that we need for our members and that the public needs as well. Everyone is trying to do all they can to remain safe and healthy above all, but also to manage our jobs, our families, and our own personal health and emotional well-being. There's so much to juggle, and our members are working extremely hard to do what is best for students, because we are all here for students, and the more we can continue to collaborate and communicate, the better it will be for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Megan Stewart Sicking from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. Good evening. Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. It's wonderful to be back here with you. Throughout this fall, CCAC has been working with parents to learn more about experiences with virtual learning, and we know that experiences are varied. One group of students is engaging virtual learning, and a few even prefer online classes. Another group consists of those who cannot engage at all. We know these students need a return to classrooms to regain lost skills and move forward, or perhaps they need a one-to-one -one physically present with them in the home. There is also a third category of students, and they are being largely ignored. This is the group that could learn virtually if they had the proper supports. These students don't have to experience intense frustrations and growing learning gaps. They could make progress, but the barriers in distance learning are too many and the solutions and supports provided are too few. We have heard so many comments from special needs parents that I can't possibly list them now. They will be forwarded to you this week. We have heard about parents who are at their breaking point watching their child regress or become frustrated or demoralized. We have heard about kids begging for this to stop or slow down. The fact is many teachers are putting on a brave face and many parents are doing their best. 
but virtual learning is not working for many children. Additional supports and interventions could improve the situation, but these issues are not being problem solved fast enough at a system level. Every teacher and administrator is reinventing the wheel every day in the name of making sure plans are individualized. You can provide a framework and still have things be individualized. Are you really telling me four weeks into the school year we can't have Schoology accounts for aides to access curriculum materials? Are you telling me if a child can't manipulate an online worksheet that printed materials and workbooks can't be available at this point? Are you telling me, given the number of students who need a scribe, no one thought on a large scale about who will write for them? Are you telling me that students who can't learn in a large group shouldn't be placed in small group or individual instruction because no one has a staffing plan for this? Because that's what schools and parents are telling me about problems that should have been solved weeks ago. Supports added now may cost something, but they won't cost nearly as much as the compensatory services needed if we allow these needs to go unaddressed. These are students who don't need to fall as far behind as you are letting them fall. I've been the chair of the CCAC for five years. I've spent countless hours advocating for more teachers, more resources, reduced caseloads, working to make the lives of special needs students and teachers better. I know my rights and I know about resources, yet my own child hasn't been able to make it through a single class and has received almost no education since school began because he can't access it. We can ignore the issue, but it won't go away. Virtual learning is going to be with us and many special needs students for some time to come. We need to get honest about the problems with virtual learning and the possible solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Julie miller uh, present Chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, board members, Dr. Williams, and the BCPS community. Before anything else, I would like to welcome new board members, Dr. Aaron Hager, and student member of the board, Josh Mahumza. We really look forward to working with you and hopefully meeting you in person one day. I would also like to acknowledge all the work that BCPS has put into trying to provide the best possible educational experience for the students this year. It cannot have been easy. I also mm -hmm. want to let you know that as of this year, I am the co-chair of the GTCAC and I'm sharing that role with Dr. Zamira Simpkins. I know you will all welcome her as she becomes active with her new role. We are excited to have her on board. As we all know, the normal school calendar has been interrupted by the current pandemic, forcing changes to routine procedures and timelines in all aspects of K-12 education. These changes have been significant within gifted education programs across the country ranging from suspension of programming to rescheduling and reconceptualizing advanced placement tests to outright canceling college entrance exams. We know many students face severe learning limitations starting in mid-March due to lack of devices, limited internet services, and reduced learning time. We also know that other students had few limitations and may have learned as much, if not more, than they would have if attending school in person. Out-of-school learning experiences likely also varied greatly. We also know that due to the cancellation of state tests and missed opportunities for additional data that would have been gathered during the spring months, there may be significant data limitations that could impact the ability to appropriately identify students for gifted services. We know that gathering data primarily from teachers during the identification process is not without significant limitations. Research provides ample evidence that teacher rating scales and recommendations can be unreliable and biased against certain groups of students. Any identification system that includes teacher input should be based on a strong professional learning program, and such training will be even more critical given the current crisis and its likely effects on student learning this fall. We hope that BCPS is focusing on the potential for advanced learning rather than advanced performance during its selection processes. Excellence gaps are almost certainly growing during the pandemic, and a tight focus on advanced performance will exclude students who don't have access to the technology and support that would allow them to thrive in an online environment. Many of these students may also be living in communities being ravaged by the pandemic, adding a level of potentially long-term trauma that needs to be factored into identification decisions. We will be talking with Wade Kearns, Coordinator of Advanced Academics at our first GTCAC meeting on Wednesday, October 7th at 7 p.m. This will be a virtual meeting and the link to access it can be found on both our Facebook page and on our website at bcps gtcac.wordpress.com. Thank you for finding a mechanism to allow stakeholder groups and the general public to address the board using this call-in process 
and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Miller-Breeds. The uh, next stakeholder speaking this evening is Mr. Kenneth Gutman, representing the Career and Technology Technical Education Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Cause, the Vice Chair and Dr. Williams and members of the board. I'm Ken Gutman, Chair of the Career and Technical Education Advisory Committee. As background on me, I'm a product of BCPS, having attended Lock Raven Elementary School, Middle School, and High School, and I currently have three children enrolled in BCPS. I'm here to highlight CTE programs in BCPS. CTE provides 21st century career-relevant education to students, making them ready for productive careers or for college. There are currently more than 30 CTE programs of study over 10 career clusters. These programs provide students employability skills, including job-related skills, project-based learning and internship opportunities, industry apprenticeship programs, and importantly, the opportunity to earn industry certifications while in high school. CTE continues to deliver instruction in a virtual setting. Since March, the CTE office has identified teachers that are recognized as subject matter experts to revise the pacing guides, provide sample lessons, and facilitate professional learning conversation for 278 courses. Additionally, the CTE office is preparing a plan for programs to return to the school building in small cohorts. Two good, good news items to share. Number one, a virtual opportunity is being planned for 8,400 eighth grade students to interact with more than 60 businesses that will showcase CTE pathways to future careers. This is being done through a partnership with school counseling, social studies, and parent university. Number two, a CTE food vending trailer will be delivered in early October. This opportunity will provide internship hours for students in our culinary arts and baking and pastry programs. It will allow students to research and plan menus, apply their classroom experiences, and provide outreach to the community. Recently, the CTE advisory committee agreed to form a committee, a subcommittee, to review the barriers to equal access to CTE programs. We'll be delivering more information on this in the future. The CTE Advisory Committee is committed to bringing relevant information to the board throughout the school year. We look forward to providing updates to you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutman. And now our public Hello. comment. Our first speaker is Ms. Allison Carter. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Allison Carter, and I'm a teacher at Dundalk Middle School. I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools who are voicing overwhelming outrage over the hasty and ill-informed reopening. I'm a seventh-year teacher who always knew that education was my passion. I've had the experience of being a high-risk student and now educator and can attest to the overwhelming fear and anxiety of existing in the COVID era, knowing that my body will not protect me from this virus. I'm terrified of being forced back into schools at this point, as is happening with the four targeted schools, as I would have to make a choice between my safety and my employment, because if I got this virus, I would not survive. I'm 28 years old with my entire life ahead of me. I am not expendable. Being high risk does not mean that I'm unwilling to teach. My obstacles have ingrained in me empathy and patience that make me an incredible educator for my students. I give everything for this job, but I should not have to give my life. Now let's look at the numbers. A recent study from the Center of Mathematical Modeling and Infectious Diseases concluded that 22% of the global population has at least one underlying condition that puts them at high risk of severe COVID if infected. So quick calculating will tell you that that puts approximately 2,425 of our teachers in ESPs at high risk and 25,396 of our students at high risk. That's at least 27,821 lives being treated as a casualty in these forced reopenings. The trauma of losing a child, a classmate, teacher, bus driver, or family member to COVID does not have to happen. This is preventable. We have a responsibility to protect our students and educators, and we have the infrastructure already in action to do so. An educator from one of the targeted schools stated, quote, in my 10 years working at this school, I have attended the funerals of three students due to their medically fragile condition. I don't care if parents sign waivers. I do not want to attend another student's funeral, end quote. BCPS is sending their most high-risk and medically fragile students back into schools from these targeted schools. A threat to our most vulnerable populations is a threat to our communities as a whole. These decisions must prioritize protecting our communities and stopping preventable death and trauma. 
Students and families who are high risk are offered accommodations, including opting to continue virtual learning instead. In reopening plans, educators are not provided the same courtesy. Why? Are we expendable? Reentering schools is a calculated risk, but BCPS is doing the math and not letting us see the formula. Loss of life is not a risk worth taking, but I do have some good news. This is completely preventable. We have the infrastructure for virtual learning and are getting into a rhythm with rigorous and engaging learning opportunities. We can build upon this foundation and make our virtual pathway an incredible experience. There is no good solution that will please everyone, but there is a safe solution that working together, we can make good, if not amazing. I urge you to choose the safe path. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Anna Weisberg. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Anna Weisberg. I'm a teacher at Deep Creek Middle School. I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools and voicing outrage over hasty and ill-informed reopening. I'm going to read excerpts from a letter from Marjorie Salata, nurse at Ridge Ruxton School, to whom it may concern. I am writing to state that I am not in agreement with the latest reentry plan proposed that will require only the four special schools to reopen. In my opinion, this plan is driven by political pressure at federal and state government levels, as well as by monetary incentives offered by Governor Hogan, rather than by sound health advice from medical experts. If the health and safety of to all continue in is English, the top press priority, one. then but why are we being reckless when it comes to the most vulnerable students in the system? A large number of students at the special schools have multiple serious medical diagnoses and are extremely medically fragile. These students are at a high risk for life-threatening consequences if they contract COVID-19. It is not recommended by medical experts that high-risk individuals of any age be cohorted in enclosed spaces for extended periods of time with questionable building ventilation and the inability of students to comply with social distancing or the wearing of masks. Most of our students cannot sit at a desk for more than short periods of time without moving around the classroom impulsively. Staff members cannot maintain social distancing when feeding and toileting students. If we cannot adhere to federal CDC guidelines, then how can we reopen these schools? The four special schools should be the last to reopen, not the first. According to the CDC, if schools can only implement one to two of the five key mitigation strategies correctly and consistently, Welcome to the audio conference that center. indicates higher Please. risk of transmission in schools. The special schools can only implement two out of five of these key mitigation strategies, cleaning and contact tracing. We cannot implement the other three strategies, consistent and correct use of masks, social distancing, and hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. This data precludes the ability for BCPS to open the four special schools. Does BCPS want the liability risk associated with implementing a re-entry plan that cannot ensure basic CDC guidelines are followed? I implore you to return to the table and carefully consider the health and safety of our medically fragile students by rescinding this unsafe reopening plan before a tragedy occurs. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next public speaker for the evening is Kristen Nielsen. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kristen Nielsen. I'm an English teacher at Crossroads Center and the 2019-2020 Teacher of the Year for BCPS. I stand in solidarity with educators and families of the four targeted schools in voicing outrage over hasty and ill-informed reopening. I plan to speak on the intersections of race and COVID and the needs of my scholars and colleagues. However, that changed with Dr. Williams' second announcement and new directive. This excerpt reflects many of my own experiences and emotions, so it was written by a self-contained special educator at Maiden Choice. Maiden Choice is not just a school, we are a family. We come together in solidarity because we love what we do and we know the value of the students that we teach. When the virus first happened and the school closed, I spoke to many coworkers 
about how they were coping with the pandemic and how they were handling the change. First and foremost was the concern for our students and how we were going to teach our students virtually. We banded together to learn and deliver more than the county was requiring of us. The students deserved it. Countless hours of learning new computer programs, ways to engage our students through a computer screen, interactive methods to assess how much our children were learning. We were learning right along with them. We supported our parents and involved them in each new opportunity we were presenting. Was it perfect? No, but the one thing teachers do best is reflect on what's working and what's not. Over the summer, most of the teachers spent their summer vacation learning new ways to interactively engage and assess the kids. We worked together to build great lessons, new ways to support parents and educate ourselves on new possibilities in education. Is virtual learning the ideal way for our students to learn? No. Are they learning? Yes. Can we do a better job? Always. With parent support and education and instructional protocols, we can provide a strong instructional mechanism virtually. Instructional protocol, protocols we can provide, um, excuse me, adult family helpers can provide the hands-on instructional supports just like our adult assistants do in school. This virtual learning situation has provided us a great opportunity to support families in their own homes. Many of our children's education centers around life skills both in the home and community. This unique situation is opening the door to allow us to help with that instruction directly in the home, not just for life skills, but also behavioral and emotional issues. Having parents working directly with their children during lessons has afforded them an opportunity to expand skills as well. The beginning of the year started strong. Our students are participating every day in learning. Please don't put them at risk. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Christina McLaughlin. Good evening. Madam Chair, you're muted. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Christina McLaughlin. Staff, can you um, can you view if she is still connected? Good evening. My name is Christina McLaughlin. I'm a paraeducator at the Rosedale Center. I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools and voicing outrage over a hasty and ill-informed reopening. As a 13-year employee of BCPS, I miss going to work and supporting students in a classroom because virtual teaching is challenging. But I want to return when it's safe for my students and myself. As an individual who is high risk, not only am I concerned about myself, but I am extremely concerned about the health and safety of my mother who I live with. She has advanced stage COPD. Like my fellow colleagues, I feel that I am being made to choose between life and my employment. Right now, I don't have a choice. I need to work. If my mother contracts this virus, she won't survive that I am left blaming myself for her death. Is that fair to me? We have heard from many educators from Maiden Choice and Battle Monument who fear for the safety and health of their students and families. A self-contained educator at Maiden Choice stated, many of my students have become critically ill during my tenure. I followed some of my students by teaching them at home while on home and hospital at the same time continuing my job at Maiden Choice. I spent several nights in Hopkins pick you with family. I've become friends and with most of my families of students I have taught over the years. This past year has been particularly difficult. I lost four of my students this year to difficult medical issues, 
which they have suffered. One child I visited the night before he died and arrived at his home 30 minutes after they had removed his body. My most recent student we lost at Christmas time. I was privileged to be with her family the night of her death. I don't tell you this to invoke sympathy. I tell you this because it's a true fear of losing another child to illness, especially one that could be prevented by staying virtual for just a little while longer. As you're aware, we have so many educators who are suffering during this pandemic. BCPS needs to show care and concern for these educators and their families. I would like the board to consider the health and well-being of our educators, students, and their families from Maiden's Choice, Battle Monument, Ridge Ruxton, and White Oak. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Jonathan Holtzman. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, members of the board. My name is Jonathan Holtzman. I am a social studies teacher at Woodlawn High School. Um, I'm speaking in solidarity with the educators and the families of the four targeted schools who are voicing overwhelming outrage over a hasty and ill-informed opening. As a third generation BCPS educator, Team BCPS is a family for whom I regard with much love. Um, and with any loving family, um, sometimes it's important that uh, we have tough conversations. Tonight, I wanna to have a conversation for a few minutes about some policy choices that um, are now before the board and will soon be before the board and BCPS executive leadership. Um, I hope that these choices can be made in a way that ensures the safety and learning of students, families, teachers, and staff um, in these coming months. I wanna talk about some of the tools that are at hand um, for the board as these tough decisions um, arise. One of the first tools I wanna to speak on is one that seems to be broken, and that is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Yesterday, the New York Times reported that in an article that the White House has been pressuring the Centers for Disease Control and, Pre and Prevention to play down the risk of sending children to school. White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force Leader, Dr. Deborah Birx, has directly intervened in pushing less relevant information to the four of CDC reports, and the White House has requested snazzy, easy to read documents that indicate that there is low to no risk for school-aged children to reattend school. I bring this up to emphasize the importance of gathering facts um, independently and not relying upon um, political trends at the federal or even the state level. We don't need to be reminded of the fact that this is a dreadful situation having to work virtually. However, the alternative of deaths of students, deaths of teachers, deaths of staff members and their families is completely unacceptable. And this board and BCPS leadership has the opportunity to prevent it from happening. Additionally, I wanted to raise that this same issue of chicanery with uh, statistics is occurring to some degree at the state level. And as we've seen in multiple Baltimore Sun reports, um, there is a intense discrepancy between the reporting of coronavirus cases by the state compared to Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. I'm gonna go with the School of Public Health um, considering that their only job is to promote just that, public health. Another thing that I want to discuss tonight is the role that this board can play in ensuring that decisions made at the state level are made in the best interest of the safety and of the safety of students and staff. It is imperative that the board directly work with Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Kelly Garrison. Good evening. Good 
Ms. Garrison, you're on mute. Ms. Garrison, we are still not hearing you. If you could check your device and make sure that you are unmuted. We are still not able to hear you. While Ms. Garrison um, uh, attempts to uh, reconnect, we will go to our next speaker, Ms. Lena Amick. Hello, my name is Lena Amick. I'm a proud social studies teacher at Owings Mills High School, and I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools in voicing outrage over hasty and ill-informed reopening. One of the things that makes Owings Mills special to me in my four years of teaching is the diversity of our student body. As an ESOL center, over a third of the students at OMHS are migrants, the majority of whom arrived within the past few years from Central America. A little over 40% of the students in our school community are Latino. According to data shared by the Baltimore Sun, Latinos face the highest rate of infection of any ethnic group in Maryland. Out of all ethnic groups in the U.S., Latinos are least likely to carry health insurance. The threat of this deadly virus shapes the day-to-day -day reality of my students and their families acutely. I've had multiple students tell me of family members who have faced serious illness. I know several students who are out for weeks with a virus that also affected their parents, grandparents, nieces, little siblings. Many of my students work in restaurants, potentially exposing themselves to illness in order to support their families who have lost income in this recession. While online learning isn't ideal, it has allowed my students to learn at their own pace while juggling other responsibilities. A hastily timed return to school buildings would not only disrupt learning, it would disproportionately put the lives of my Latino students and their families at risk, who are already fighting daily just to get by. I also want to echo the words of RN Marjorie Salata, school nurse at Ridge Rexton School, one of the targeted schools for a rushed reopening. She asked, if the health and safety of all students is a top priority, then why are you being reckless when it comes to the most vulnerable students in our system? What I hear from my students six months into this pandemic is weariness and fear of the unknown. A return to school that's based on politics rather than proof would further isolate and harm communities made vulnerable by systemic racism, economic and legal vulnerabilities, health disparities, and barriers to accessing affordable and quality health care in something that could amount to a death sentence. I speak for all my silo ed educators in BCPS when I say that I am deeply dedicated to my students' safety and success. Just today, I spent 45 minutes after class one-on-one -on -one supporting an ESOL student to make sense of our day's reading. I was imagining how much harder it would be for her to overcome the challenges of learning an entirely new language in a different country, along with all the pressures of being a teenager, while fearing daily for her safety and her family's lives, or facing the trauma of losing a loved one. Just like in non-pandemic times, we need to do as a district what we as educators are trained to do, plan for our students' success using data. I believe that we can and must. Thank you. Thank you. And we now have Ms. Kelly Garrison on the line. Welcome. Ms. Garrison, we cannot hear you yet. Yes, hi. My name is Kelly Garrison. Yes, thank you. 
My name is Kelly Garrison, and I'm a first grade teacher at Villa Cresta Elementary School. I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools and voicing outrage over hasty and ill-informed reopening. My fear of returning to school in person comes from a place of concern for not only myself, but for my family, my students, my colleagues, and the community. I've been teaching for nine years at Villa Cresta Elementary School, and I miss many aspects of the face-to-face -face teaching, and I look forward to a time when it is safe to return to the school in person. Unfortunately, the time is not now. I know that I don't stand alone with the fears of returning to school too soon and having concerns for my family if I am forced to return to school before it is safe. I would like to share some other concerns from colleagues about the, that fear as well. So quick bit about uh, one of the families of a parent from my school. She's also a educator and she has been teaching for 21 years in DCPS. She loves the school and her position, but she also has a child who is a kindergartner in DCPS schools and is high risk. She also has a mother who is a caregiver and the teacher at home for virtual learning who is also high risk, and a spouse who is also a teacher for BCPS. Her concerns come from a place of returning to school too soon, and while she, her family has taken this time to continue to make efforts to keep their family safe, that she is horrified to negate all that they have worked for in order to keep her high risk family members healthy. I'm also going to share a similar concern about how this effect of come, returning to school too soon can have potential effects on family. Someone from Maiden Choice also stated, the COVID situation raises an extremely difficult set of feelings about returning to work. Despite the struggles with the online format, I fear returning to school and at a minimum being exposed to the virus. Such exposure will result in the need for me to quarantine for my wife and family. Quarantine in my home would be very difficult. My family are all in high-risk categories due to age, pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and asthma, and I am currently under physician care for hypertension and experience bronchial complications every winter. These current situations is very terrible in every way. I know at most that we are aware that our particular students at my school and from and will gain more from education in person, but. I also know that the return of school causes significant anxiety because of contracting COVID. So before returning to school, I would like the board to consider some of these concerns to make it safe. Proper ventilation and updates to the HAVOC system, have they been recommended to ensure? Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Eugene Johnson. Good evening. My name is Eugene Johnson. I'm a social studies educator and a proud member of Team BCPS in Ram Nation at Randallstown High School. I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools in voicing outrage over hasty and ill-informed reopening. Today in class, while discussing the challenges that we face during virtual learning, I was reminded of something my grandmother told me while showing me her ration card from the Great Depression. She told me, as I relate to the class, that our United States asks each generation of citizens at least once to stick together and overcome crisis through sacrifice. Managing the COVID crisis is one of our generation's calls to action, and the sacrifices we make must be in the name of uplifting our communities, not on the backs of our most vulnerable. In March, Educators quickly sacrificed and got down to extending meaningful learning opportunities for virtual learning. When we were feted as heroes in June, we knew that we had to relish the rare praise we were receiving. We predicted, and we were right, that it would be short-lived. And yet we persisted. In preparation for the fall, we each sacrificed hundreds of surplus hours of planning and preparation time to make this work. We did it in spite of the hardships because it was the morally justifiable thing to do. 
Educators have done more to advance education in this county into the 21st century in six months than has been done in 60 years. We became masters of new tools and new ways of thinking. If we were to ask our kids to do the same, we had to demand it of ourselves. Each of us has also made striking financial sacrifices to fill in the gaps. I live with my partner, who is a fellow educator in a one-bedroom apartment. To accommodate virtual learning and have enough space, we temporarily moved back in with my father. The internet wasn't up to par. We invested in upgraded equipment and a higher speed plant. Students told me that my microphone was muffled. I bought a standing microphone, so no learning goals would be lost. The list goes on. My partner and I have both spent well above the $250 deduction cap for educators just in the last month alone. How many on this board have ever felt compelled to personally buy supplies for coworkers so that they could get their jobs done? There are no monthly expense reports in our classrooms, but this is our civic duty. This board must continue to show respect for the sacrifices of the students and the educators it serves, and it must demand truly safe reopening procedures. As a budget crisis looms on the horizon for this county, it must not break the backs of educators and students to entertain false choices about economic realities. Our schools are already wrung dry of surplus funding. Advancing creative budget negotiations can be your sacrifice, and I thank you in advance for rising to our shared challenge. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ben Begleiter. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Ben Begleiter. I am a parent who has a child who attends George Washington Carver Center, and my family lives in Towson. Fundamental to BCPS is the interconnectedness of the district. Through Magnet and other special schools, students from all over the district come together to learn. Teachers and staff as well come from a variety of places in the county and beyond. During normal times, this is a benefit that enriches our students and our classrooms. At the present time, it is a liability. It means that COVID-19 won't be contained in a single part of the county, but if there are missteps, there, there is widespread exposure that could lead to cases all over the county and beyond. I signed up to speak today because of the superintendent's letter of September 17th announcing a tentative reopening schedule. I recognize that Superintendent Williams has largely retracted that letter. But I still wish to, to address it because I think it speaks to a real failure of leadership by putting the cart before the horse. The district should focus first on producing a clear, concise reopening plan that lays out in detail the mitigation strategies and building upgrades that the district is undertaking, as well as the timeline for the implementation. That plan should then be circulated to stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, and staff for input because each of the stakeholders brings a different perspective that will make the plan better. Only after a plan has been agreed upon and the upgrades underway should we begin to discuss a date for reopening. I want to acknowledge that there is a plan on the BCS website, but from my reading of it, it is wholly inadequate for the question of reopening. In my limited time, I wanna focus on just one area. The current consensus seems to be that COVID-19 is largely airborne. This means that the focus of our efforts should be to mitigate those risks, which is largely not in the reopening plan. We need an accounting of the HVAC systems in every building. Do those HVAC systems meet current recommendations? How will students and teachers eat and drink if they remove masks? To do so, will the HVAC system blow the virus from one room to the next, potentially contaminating every classroom? Is the district buying appropriately sized HEPA filters for every room? What are the protocols if a student refuses to wear a mask? What is the protocol for students going to the bathroom when some research suggests that flushing the toilet causes contaminated fecal matter to enter the air? How is the district going to require increased hand washing? I could go on and on, but I have limited time. To be blunt, we can't afford to get this wrong. We cannot afford to let political pressure dictate the district strategy for reopening. Because if we do, children, teachers, staff, parents, grandparents, and members of the broader community will die. Thank you. Our final speaker for the evening is 
Shay Savoy. Good evening and welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Oh, good evening. Thank you, Chairwoman Kazi, Mr. Mahamza, and members of the board. My name is Shay Savoy, and I teach 10th grade English at Woodlawn High School, home of the Warriors. And I stand in solidarity with the educators and families of the four targeted schools in voicing outrage over a hasty and ill-informed reopening. I'm speaking tonight as an educator who is a member of the Woodlawn community, a community disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. I'll get right down to it. When the coronavirus reached Baltimore County, it burrowed its spiky head deep into our zip code, 21207, and it has not let up. Tonight, six months later, when I looked up the county map that shows the concentration of COVID cases, I found that Woodlawn is still smack dab in the middle of the deepest red. But that's just a two-dimensional map. Numbers, lines, shades ranging from beige to brown to blood red. Peel back the paper with its clean, bloodless lines, and I see an ocean of young faces, their hearts, their poems, their essays, their pencils, their parents, grandparents, aunties. I smell dry erase markers and packed hallways of adolescents with their clouds of cologne and sweat. And then... I hear the email notification whistling, whistling the messages that nonstop flooded my inbox over the course of the spring. Messages from my students or from parents or from school counselors notifying me that we lost another family member, another caregiver, another beloved. Woodlawn has been rocked with grief and loss. And if we are forced to go back before it's safe, Woodlawn stands to lose even more. Woodlawn High School, with its approximately 1,600 students and 200 staff members, the Woodlawn community home to a high concentration of essential frontline workers, Woodlawn disproportionately impacted by the legacies of systemic racism, lack of access to adequate resources, adequate health care, and a system that fights for our community instead of against it. We are Woodlawn strong, but we are not invincible. We are unimaginably vulnerable to this deadly disease with its insidious, silently creeping reach. The common sense reversal of the superintendent's insulting and dangerous re-entry timeline recently proposed is just the beginning. I stand here tonight as a Woodlawn warrior, and I stand here to demand justice for the targeted schools of White Oak, Ridge Ruxton, Battle Monument, and Maiden Choice. The people of these schools are not expendable. I demand real justice. The promise that our lives, our health... Thank you, Ms. Savoy. Her time is finished. And that concludes our public comment segment. Uh, we appreciate the views of all stakeholders. And I appreciate our staff arranging and working through um, the, the technical issues so that we can connect with our stakeholders. Our next item on the agenda is item G, new business action taken in closed session. And there was no action taken. So we're moving on to item H, new business contract awards. And for that, I call on uh, buildings. Oh, we didn't have buildings and contracts. I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Saris to present the contracts. Uh, good, good afternoon, afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, we have two items uh, that uh, are sort of... Um, more urgent, so we ask that we, they be added to this uh, agenda, which is not typical. Um, the first item is LKO 400-20, Human Resource and Financial Management System Enterprise Software. This is a uh, contract modification uh, to provide for the continued use of our Advantage 
uh, management software, software license fees, and ongoing support and maintenance. We are requesting approval to expand the scope of work uh, to support the implementation of the 12-month pay option directed by the board on June 11th and to increase contract spending authority by $209,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to uh, 10545000 uh, over the next four years and two months, with one awarded vendor approved by the board in August 2019. Board members, are there questions or comments for Mr. Saris related to the human resource and financial management system enterprise software? Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Saris. Good evening. Um, I just have one question. You had mentioned that both of these recommendations were coming because they were more urgent rather than to the Building and Contracts Committee? Correct. Um, the okay. board was very specific in its directives that we move with all deliberation to implement this 12-month pay project. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of milestones that we have to reach uh, in very short order. We've already uh, met since last spring with employees and the employee groups. Um, and we uh, need to have at least the, uh, the first major uh, steps in place by July. And uh, this, uh, Scope of work extends over about a 22-month period, and in order to meet that July 1 of uh, 2022 deadline uh, to have the program fully tested and in place, uh, we need to begin immediately, and, uh, and that's why we're bringing this uh, forward at this time. Sure, and as I understand it, approval is requested to increase the contract spending authority. My question right, is, right. there seems to be plenty of authority to cover the additional 209,000 being requested, um, given that the lifetime expenditures so far, I believe were 1.5 million. So I'm curious as to the need, I guess, for urgency, given that um, there was already 10.3 million um, previously approved by the board. Uh, we just wanted to make very sure uh, that the board understood the cost of the program and that they were uh, would fully support it uh, based on the the costs. Okay, and and I understand, and and thank you for the changes to the template. By the way, they are very helpful seeing the information outlined um, on the contract exhibit form. So thank you for making those changes. I'm, I'm still unclear as to if, if we had previously approved authority of 10.3 million and what is being requested is um, a modification for a total of 10.5, um, the current lifetime expenditures were only 1.5 well, How the, do you need for the, approval of two hundred nine thousand. Yeah, the spending authority was was pretty carefully constructed uh, when we put it together uh, last de December of twenty nineteen uh, over the next five years to take into account our regular annual license fees, the inflation cost adjustment that's built into the contract and and even with some allowance for consulting costs but it was very possible that at some point over the remaining term of the contract this particular expenditure could um, could push us over that limit uh, because it's an estimate and so we wanted to make sure at the outset and as soon as we knew, that there was this possibility um, that we bring it to the board's attention. 
Sure, and I certainly don't want to delay this project, which is a priority for the board. However, I don't think we're going to be exceeding the spending authority in two weeks, which is when the Building and Contracts Committee meets. So my concern is that this wasn't run through the committee, not the fact that I have any concerns with approving the additional spending authority. That's my only concern, is the need to bring this to the full board. Is there a procedural issue with, with making that adjustment that we should be aware of in terms of adjusting the, the authority to match the scope well, of the project? Well, just that the board must approve changes that exceed $25,000. So that's okay. why we brought it, because we cannot be entirely sure that it won't result in this exact same uh, approval sometime later on. Okay, thank you. That's all I. Miss Joes? I'm actually okay. I think Miss Hen asked some of my questions. Thank you. Other board members? Okay, Mr. Stairs, if you want to move on to the next contract. Uh, I saw Mr. Kuhn's hand. Oh, yeah. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, my only question, and I guess, um, you know, I, I, I agree that there's $10.3 million left in this contract so, or in total. So I don't see the, you know, the, the necessity to, to bring it to us tonight, but that's fine. Um, my question that I have is, are you expecting the 200 nine thousand extra dollars to be spent within the next year is that is that why you brought it forward at this time no as i said um it is our estimate over the next uh 22 months um and it entails okay. about 1100 hours and it's an estimate at this point all right thanks Other board members before we move on to the next contract? Okay, thank you, Mr. Saris. You can continue. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. The next item is uh, CWA 105 21 Google Enterprise Licenses. Uh, this is a new cooperative contract for the Department of Information Technology. Approval is requested for a three year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $291,000. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Saris, under the description, and perhaps it's an old description, but it says the contract spending authority is intended for a single year license. Yet this goes through 2023 for a three year term. Is that just a mistake? Is it supposed to be for three years? I'm curious. No, um, this is uh, what's called a piggyback contract or cooperative agreement. And, uh, and we uh, parallel the terms of that contract when we bring it to the board. So the contract that we're using has three years left on it, but we've only uh, requested spending authority um for the the next year okay so have to come back to the board uh, and it's possible you know when we re god hopefully we return to a a typical operating environment that we won't need these enhanced features and and so we may not need to spend this money further beyond beyond the next year Okay, well, th thank you for the clarification because at the top of the form, it also says approval is requested for three year contract. So it's right. it, it sounds like we're signing a three year contract, but you said that this is specifically $291,000 for this year only. Correct. And we only expect this to be paid and covering one year. I am very hopeful that's the case. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Ms. Joes? 
Thank you. Mr. Saris, you said this was under your uh, piggyback under the source well contract. Right. And these services are specifically to provide uh, additional technical services because of COVID-19. Um, is that correct? Correct. So Ex the yeah. go ahead. Sorry. So the original contract, uh, that didn't include this service? And this was something that's added on? Well, uh, what happened was that uh, we're using, as it mentions here, we're using our, our typical uh, free G Suite software. Um, what happened back in March when uh, school systems across the country turned to the uh, internet to support instruction, um, uh, Google offered these expanded features at no cost. And uh, we learned in the last few weeks that uh, that generous free offer was, was going to expire this month. And so given that we still greatly rely on these enhancements, uh, we need to go ahead and, and purchase them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saris. You're welcome. Ms. Mack? Ms. Mack, we cannot hear you if you need to unmute. Sorry, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Saris. Good evening. Uh, can you just confirm for me? I know you, I think you told Ms. Hen, but I just want to make sure that we do not approve this contract tonight and take it back to building in contracts on the 13th, that we will not jeopardize this project in any way. Is that true? Well, in this case, we will because I believe the license. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not talking, I'm talking about the former contract. I apologize. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, um, well, I think with a project that entails a lot of unknowns, we're doing something for the first time and it's very complex. Um, if you want to compare it to building a school, uh, when you're two years out, it seems like you have all the time in the world. And when, you know, Labor Day rolls around and, and workers are frantically trying to finish the school so that it can open, that two weeks becomes very valuable. So uh, I think the board's direction was very clear and we wanna make sure uh, that we start as soon as possible on this project, even though July 21st of 22 seems like a long way off. But we have $10 million in the project right now, is that correct? Correct. And we're not gonna spend this 200 nine thousand dollars in the next two weeks is that correct correct i think what i'm struggling with and i'm new to building in contracts is we have a process for contracts to be brought to the committee and then presented to the full board and i don't quite understand based on the last two answers that you gave why this would be brought up tonight and not brought to the um, building in contracts on the third Well, I don't have any any more information to provide than what I've already done. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Mahamza, I saw your hand up and then it was gone. Did you want to speak to this, Mr. Mahamza? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other board members with uh, questions or comments? Do I have a motion to approve items H1 and H2? So moved, Kuhn. Is there a second? Second, Molly. <clears throat> Any further discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? 
Chris Gover, I was muted, uh, and I didn't do it. Yes, my, is my answer. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rao? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you very much. Our next item on the agenda is item I, report on opening of schools. Uh, and for that, we uh, call on the community superintendents to come forward to present the report. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Williams for having Dr. Um, Mary Boswell McComas available to answer questions and um, prepared to answer questions about uh, recent athletic announcements. So good evening and welcome. So good evening, Chair Cauthy, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams and members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity to present to you on the opening of schools. This evening, I'm joined by Dr. Jones, Dr. Boswell McComas, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Zarchin, and Dr. Scriven. During the last board meeting, you received a presentation on virtual learning. At that time, information regarding virtual teaching and learning and technology support was shared. As a result, this presentation is going to focus on the alignment between our strategic plan and the opening of schools through the lens of the schoolhouse. Prior to beginning our presentation this evening, we wanted to reaffirm responses regarding attendance that were provided during the presentation on virtual learning two weeks ago. Attendance is taken daily at the elementary level and both daily and by period at the secondary level. If a student is not in attendance, the first level of intervention always occurs with the student's teacher. If intervention regarding attendance is needed beyond the level of the teacher, a school-based attendance committee institutes a multi-tiered approach to intervention. This may include follow-up with an administrator, a school counselor, a department chairperson, or a grade level chair. If those interventions between the schoolhouse and the student or family are unsuccessful, our schools work collaboratively with their pupil personnel worker to provide support to the student and family. All of our schools have a staff member who is a liaison between the school and staff from our Department of School Climate. At the next board meeting, there will be a presentation on school climate and safety which will provide more in-depth information regarding how that division directly provides systemic supports to our schools. Furthermore, the same multi-tiered system of support would be used if a student had not engaged in the spring and or summer and has sporadic or chronic absenteeism. This information is monitored at the school level and by our school leadership teams. Finally, as indicated during the last meeting, any further related data could be shared at a future curriculum committee meeting. Next slide, please. So over the course of the last year and under the leadership of Dr. Williams, information was collected from a variety of stakeholder groups to drive the development of our strategic plan. This summer, our new strategic plan, the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence was approved. This strategic plan is the foundation of the work done in schools and in support of our schools. Our presentation this evening is going to focus on how we support the opening of schools, specifically in the areas of learning accountability and results and operational excellence. Next slide, please. Through collaboration across multiple divisions, Baltimore County Public Schools authored a new teaching and learning framework. The BCPS teaching and learning framework outlines the expectations for effective first instruction and rigorous learning for every child in every classroom every day. It is grounded in BCPS policy 0100 equity and it includes components from research and best practices including Charlotte Danielson's framework for teaching, Mike Schmoker's focus, elevating the essentials to radically improve student learning, 
and the Center for Applied Special Technologies Principles of Universal Design for Learning. In BCPS, all students must have daily access to learning that is accessible, rigorous, relevant, and responsive, and that prepares them for their future. This teaching and learning framework clearly articulates the core beliefs and expectations of teaching and learning in BCPS. It develops a common language to facilitate instructional conversations among our educators, students, parents, and caregivers to drive continuous improvement. It provides resources to support high quality first instruction, and it ensures a consistent approach to monitoring teaching and learning. Prior to the opening of schools, this document was presented to our school leaders and it became the seminal work that drives both virtual and face-to-face -face teaching and learning in BCPS. At this time, I would like to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Raquel Jones. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Byers. Additionally, as part of the opening of schools and aligned to focus area one, we are implementing new curricula. New curricula in elementary English language arts, ELA, and mathematics in order to increase student achievement. Students and teachers have access to high quality instructional materials aligned with the rigor of college and career ready standards. Updates have been made for all curricula areas. These updates include revision to scope and sequences to adjust for unfinished learning, embedded diagnostic tasks to support acceleration from unfinished learning to current grade level standards, and professional learning on the new teaching and learning framework. Specifically, new curricula for elementary involves full implementation of bridges, grades K to two, partial implementation of bridges, grades three to five, focused on number corners, and a rollout of open court, grades two and three. Our secondary curricula updates are as follows. In math, we are piloting Desmos at select middle schools. Professional learning is being offered to support HMH Go Math, highly, relate, highly rated materials. Algebra pilots will also be explored. Lastly, disciplinary literacy and reading apprenticeship continue as a function of our Striving Readers Grant. Next slide, please. Focus Area 1, accountability, Learning Accountability and Results, Key Initiative 5, focuses on service and support model for schools. The graphic represents our core work within the Division of School Support and Achievement. In supporting schools during opening, the DSSA team work with individual school leadership teams to develop school progress plans that ground the work in professional learning in the school to ameliorate the persistent and widening gaps that exist for underserved, pop underserved populations of students. By the end of October, each school will have a public facing snapshot of their school progress plan or SPP on their website for stakeholders. This will help stakeholders understand the core work of the school for the 2020-21 academic year. I will now turn it over to Dr. Zarchin to share more about focus area four, family engagement and outreach, the opening of schools. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Jones. As we focused on welcoming our students, staff, and families to the new school year, an important consideration was ensuring that the social, emotional, and physical well being of our students and families was addressed. In addition to the resources offered to our families through Family and Community Outreach Office and Parent University, our student support personnel have partnered with our schools to provide services and resources in support of the Compass's focus area for family engagement and outreach and focus area two, safe and supportive environments. Staff have engaged in the provision of telemental health services to students and families across Baltimore County Public Schools. Services include check-ins to students and families utilizing Google Meets. To support the home and school connection, virtual parent workshops have been offered. Staff have also engaged families in mentoring programs and work to connect families with internal and external resources and supports. Some of these supports include immunization support, 
self-care for caregivers who are coping with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, consultations, home visits that follow mitigation strategies, referrals for mental health services, assistance with enrollment, and outreach to families of students to increase attendance and engagement. As we move to the next slide, I would like to welcome Dr. Roberts. Good. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. While our opening of schools was virtual, we are very excited about the opening of these three new schools, Chadwick Elementary School, Berkshire Elementary School, and Colgate Elementary School. These new state-of-the-art buildings will afford our students the opportunity to learn in 21st century spaces in a safe and secure building that promotes the implementation of our academic program. We appreciate the incredible effort of our team in the Department of Facilities, as well as the principals of these three schools who have worked tirelessly preparing these schools to open. Next slide, please. A highlight of the opening of this year is evident in the way Did we lose Mr. Dr. Roberts? Dr. Roberts, we cannot hear you right now. Is there another staff member that can proceed? Yes, just give us yeah. a second, thank you. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in, Dr. Jones. Okay, you don't thank mind. you, no problem. We're all there. George, are you back? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. I think I'm losing connection. Um, we can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now? Yes. You can hear me now? Okay, here we go. Okay, I apologize for that. My internet must have, my connection must have dropped. So, um, so the partnership between our offices of transportation and food and nutrition has allowed us to continue meal service for free to all of our students in this virtual environment. Since March, we have provided over 1 million 941,684 meals for our students. Next slide, please. As in years past, and as these photos without masks are clearly from before COVID in March 13th, senior leadership in BCPS debriefs the school day every day during the first week of school. As a direct link to schools, the Division of School Support and Achievement visited in person or virtually every school in the system over the course of the first week. This allowed our division to check in with each principal or school leadership team to ascertain their needs as well as learn of their successes during the first week. Additionally, DSSA shared needs of schools across divisions so that chiefs could work to respond to and support schools. So at this time, Dr. Scriven will provide a technology update as follow-up information from our presentation on virtual learning during the September 15th Board of Education meeting. Next slide, please. So good afternoon, board members. I hope you can hear me okay, even though my camera is not working. Yes, um, we can hear you, Dr. Scriven, thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So just wanna give a high level update uh, from the uh, last board meeting that we had on uh, 9-15. In the last two weeks, we've actually uh, distributed an additional 5,000 uh, devices uh, and that is a combination of new enrollees and also uh, students who had to swap out devices uh, that were not uh, currently working. Uh, in a spirit of uh, transparency, uh, we are rapidly running out of uh, devices. We are now uh, under 1,000, roughly 857 devices. Uh, those devices will continue to go out. We are not uh, going to withhold any devices from students that are in need. We are also faced with the challenge of the devices that we still have to repair are our most challenging uh, devices to fix, which we saved uh, for the back end. Uh, we're poised, however, uh, to be receiving uh, a bulk shipment of devices in the near future, uh, which will most definitely bring uh, relief. Uh, when we look at technology support, we need to look at that through a, a, a couple of lenses. 
Uh, one, due to the shortage, there is uh, a challenge in terms of swapping out devices uh, in a timely fashion uh, because we just don't have them. Uh, and those that need to be repaired, I just want to bring to your attention that we had approximately 27,000 devices uh, that we had to distribute on the elementary, middle, and high school levels uh, that would have been devices. thank our schools uh, for the triage uh, which they are doing. And we do thank our families uh, for their patients and our stakeholders. Uh, we have definitely uh, been uh, delivering better support as it relates to our call help center. Uh, today, for example, uh, we had 254 calls. Uh, there was zero wait time in the queue and it was an average of seven minutes uh, per call in terms of, of rendering uh, support. Uh, if you look at the snapshot uh, of the 25th of this month, uh, we had 470 calls and the average wait time was a minute. So if we show you from one week to the next, we are uh, receiving less calls and we're definitely being more responsive in terms of uh, the uh, queue and folks not having to be on time uh, for an extended uh, period of time. We're roughly closing out 1,100 tickets per day. And like I said, we're receiving roughly uh, 500. Today was only 254 calls. Uh, so this is affording us the opportunity to really chip away at those tickets uh, that were uh, in the uh, back queue. Uh, we're able to now address them uh, as we are uh, not receiving as many calls as what we're able to actually address in terms of checking uh, tickets off. So we're very uh, excited uh, about that as well. Uh, so that is a uh, really high level. When you talk about tech support, it's really in the areas of uh, connection to network, uh, password reset, uh, Google Meet uh, applications, uh, issues with laptop, which is either a broken or non-working uh, device, which is the majority of the uh, tickets that we're dealing with, or, or lost or broken chargers. And then, of course, a smaller percentage of those individuals as they're uh, being enrolled or as the devices uh, are a, a broken screen, et cetera, uh, need to be swapped out. Uh, when we actually receive the first uh, bulk shipment, uh, we will be moving to a model where we will simply uh, give uh, the laptops directly to the school and students will be able to report uh, to their school in terms of swapping out uh, devices, which will be uh, a lot more uh, time responsive than the current model that we're being forced to operate under uh, based on constraints beyond uh, our control. Uh, so that brings closure, and I believe I was the last slide, so at this time, I will turn it back over to the uh, community superintendents or Dr. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Um, prior to taking questions, um, we want we like to provide the opportunity to Dr. Bob McComas and her team uh, to give them an opportunity to provide a brief systemic update regarding SAT and athletics. Uh, Dr. McComas. Yes, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, briefly with you uh, SAT and athletics. Um, I'll touch quickly on SAT. We do understand that um, it's important for us to continue to uh, problem solve and try to find opportunities for this year's seniors uh, to pursue an SAT opportunity as well as this year's juniors. 
uh, to pursue a PSAT opportunity. At this time, I wanted to update you that we do have a committee working on that, um, looking at what are options still uh, within this fall semester, if you will, um, and working through um, what would be the procedures uh, needed to um, provide different opportunities for those seniors. We have also uh, been exploring how other districts are um, problem solving this as well. So that's really the update is to assure you that we are still currently exploring those opportunities. I would like to also share that we um, do recognize that many colleges, thankfully, are um, working um, in a more flexible model this year to support seniors in their application process uh, because conditions have been so varied across the nation uh, related to SAT. And so that's really very um, short and sweet, I know, but that is in truth where we are. Um, and I will continue to bring you updates um, in working with Dr. Williams um, in multiple ways. So thank you for that. And then for athletics, I know we had a tremendously exciting announcement by the governor. Of, um, it, it felt um, like a, a long time ago now, but it really was very recent. Um, and in the governor's announcement, you know, the school systems still um, have the opportunity to uh, determine um, what is the model that is best for them? Because we know health conditions continue to be variable across the district. And I'd like to point out that Baltimore County continues to be um, a higher rate of um, COVID spread compared to some of the many other districts, uh, perhaps on the Eastern Shore or Western Maryland um, and Southern Maryland. So we have to always take into account air safety context. To that end, we do have a return to play committee um, is assembled and has been um, digging into what is the feasibility around us adjusting our model. Um, is it feasible? Is it safe? And to that end, we have been conferring with the health department and we are uh, appreciative the health department has uh, provided some of the research on models um, from other states, um, principally New York and New Jersey. And in that research, we're really exploring the risk factor um, really by sport, because we recognize that some sports are inherently more um, uh, safe than others when it comes to uh, the spread of a virus. So, uh, for example, wrestling, of course, is a high contact sport compared to, let's say, cross country. And so the models that we're really, the research that we're looking into is really helping us look at how to examine what are the low risk um, possibilities to then be able to uh, determine what is um, safe and practical. In addition to um, understanding the research and how to proceed um, forward um, in the best manner, we are also considering all of the inequities um, that um, have been and can be exacerbated by a sudden change, keeping in mind the scope of our program, we have thousands of students that play athletes, uh, athletics each season. Uh, the fall season typically has approximately 4,000 uh, students, give or take 500 in either direction, uh, depending upon the year and the season. Um, and so we know with having our previous um, plan announced of really starting up competitive and in-person uh, activities in the second semester, that there are thousands of families that have not yet had uh, their child have their physical yet, which we know just to get into a primary care physician's office uh, is not just a show up at the doorstep and you, you get in. It, it takes time and a process for families to get those physicals in place. In addition, we are analyzing um, other safety and support systems. So for example, our um, athletic trainers and our coaches, our athletic trainers uh, many of the companies that we contract uh, with uh, did furlough athletic trainers for the fall semester, knowing that um, they would return in the spring. And so there is the process of, of seeking um, feasibility around having the safety um, athletic trainers available, in addition to coaches that um, had set up their schedule in a way that they w could support virtual in the fall, but we're planning on in-person in the spring. So I share these are some of the many complicated logistics that the back to um, return to play committee, excuse me, is um, working through and exploring in terms of feasibility. 
Um, the other thing we want to keep in mind um, is also the readiness of our fields um, and, of course, the mitigation strategies related to PPE and um, all the protocols that need to go into place. We certainly recognize, and I want to thank, um, there's um, many members of the community that have emailed um, my team and I um, asking for athletics to begin, asking for athletics to be postponed, raising issues of safety, raising issues of equity. Um, and I just would like to thank everyone for um, your passion and your commitment um, so that we can begin to, um, or I shouldn't say begin, we can continue to reimagine how do we provide um, low risk opportunities for our students as soon as possible uh, within safe bounds um, and in light of the governor's uh, announcement that just came the other week. So I know that was a long and complicated uh, response, but that in all transparency is where we are in this process. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Basra Um So board at this time, we'd like to thank you for your time and attention to this presentation and the team is available to address any questions. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. And this evening we have um, a lot of reports and good information that's being presented. So uh, tonight I'm going to go around the dais for board members to make comments and ask questions with an understanding that some questions may need to uh, be answered fully um, at a later date, either through a press release or a weekly update or in some other uh, communication path. So with that, we are going to uh, start with Dr. Hager. Hi, everyone. Thank you for all of those presentations. Um, uh, Dr. McComas, thank you especially for your detailed explanation about sports. I reviewed both plans that were released uh, in, in a lot of detail, and I was just wondering if there's a possibility for a compromise plan where student athletes are allowed to practice in person during the fall semester, where then competitive play would start in the spring semester as planned. Yeah, so thank you. I think that that is something to be considered by the return to play um, committee. And I agree with you in that, um, you know, seeking opportunities given changing conditions is certainly um, something to be considered. And so Dr. Hager, thank you as always for that. Um, we too are eager for our students and we too recognize um, how beneficial the opportunity to be together um, is. And so that is certainly an aspect that the committee has been discussing and will continue to explore. I would be presumptuous if I tried to um, make a decision on behalf of the entire committee, but thank you. But is it accurate that if um, if it wouldn't be breaking any, my, my pass, isn't that how you say their, the acronym, um, rules by doing that? Is, is, it, is that a possibility? I, I I do not want to misspeak, uh, Dr. Hager, so I will defer to the committee, and that is something that I would rather allow the committee um, to provide me more details, because I just would not want to uh, speak out of turn on what would be a, a MP, um, MSPPAA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I mean, October 7th is right around the corner, and that's when this fall season would start, which seems quite soon, so um, so I appreciate that. Um, I have yes. one other question uh, from one of the earlier presentations, and um, it was stated that, that BCPS, uh, we must have learning that is accessible. That was one of the statements that was made. And I've heard a lot about concerns of, about the hotspots that were provided to the students and that it, it's not working very well. And so I don't know if anyone has any comments about the hotspots. Um, and maybe in conjunction with that, uh, the concept of academic support centers, I don't believe were discussed in the presentation, but it feels like a possible solution. So I don't know if anyone could comment a little bit on um, whether that plan is moving forward and could talk a little bit more about that. So Dr. Higa, I can certainly address the, the hotspots. I was just working actually with the principal earlier today on the east side regarding hotspots. So with the community member who has been issued a hotspot is having difficulty in this particular case, it was a hotspot that just wasn't working properly, then they reached out to the principal and, I'm sorry, I'm showing a bad network, so if you can't hear me, please let me know, um, is able to reach out to the school and to the principal and work to get that hotspot replaced. Um, again, if there's a need for a hotspot, then that is a communication between the parent and the school and we can work um, based on the established parameters for issuance of hotspots to get that to them. 
I'm not sure if you heard me, but again, my, my okay. quality. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, the, Dr. you got a second part of the question, the academic support centers. So the academic <laughs> support center, right, so the academic support centers, um, and so then we are working in conjunction with um, Baltimore County government and, and uh, certain stakeholders. So at this point, um, the timeline for that is to is beginning to move forward with academic support centers. So that could be to your point an area for additional supports um, for students who take advantage and are able to access the academic support centers. That would be certainly an opportunity for kids to receive additional supports from um, the stakeholders who are manning and operating those academic support centers. So that would be to your point an additional support opportunity. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I have one last question about the SATs, and that was um, that uh, I, the word that was used, uh, Dr. McComas, was there, there problem solving, a lot of problem solving. Are you referring to COVID safety, or are there other issues that are happening with, with administering SATs right now outside of kind of ensuring safety given the COVID? <laughs> Right. So when I refer to problem solving, I was really talking through all the logistics around um, um, exploring what's involved with um, like a Saturday national test administration, the logistics involved in ensuring that there's sanitation safety. Uh, we do know that there's um, been uh, fellow districts that have been uh, walking down this path and looking to understand um, you know, learn from their example, if you will. So that was really the, all the details involved is what I was referring to. There wasn't a specific uh, hiccup, if you will. Thank you, and that's it. Thank you. Thank Mr. Kuhn. No, thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, <clears throat> quick question about the athletics and the committee that you mentioned. Do you or has anyone set a deadline for decisions to be made? At this point, I have we have not established a deadline because we're working closely um, in partnership with our health department. And so we have not made a hard deadline on that, but we do recognize time is of the essence. Right, because we're a, a week away from October 7th. So it, it definitely is <laughs> of the essence. And my fear is if we don't make a motion in this meeting to force the hand of us moving forward on October 7th to immediately start practice, then we're going to have this discussion on October and our next meeting in October and possibly the meeting after that. So that's why I, I asked the question and I would suggest that um, the, the committee set uh, a deadline to have some responses back because I know that there's questions all over the place and lots of concerns and there's lots of student athletes who their um, their final season is moving along quickly um, uh, for their fall season and um, their their inability to get out there and exercise and and um, and play sports is is quickly is quickly missing um, moving on um, I appreciate that um, yes, sir. I have some questions about book distribution and lack of book distribution uh, in secondary, um, middle school and high school. I, I understand that um, some schools handed out textbooks and novels, and um, some schools uh, did not. And my own personal experience, having a middle schooler and a high schooler that received no books um, uh, until I requested them uh, as a parent, uh, was uh, concerning to me, and my question to you and your team is, why was there not consistency across the system? Why do we not hand books out that are important references for students in this, this time of the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for that uh, question. And so, in fact, the consistency is provided in our digital version of our textbooks. Uh, today, what is quite um, common as part of the industry um, packaging is that you um, have access to digital versions of textbooks in their entirety, as well as uh, the ability to buy uh, sets of textbooks, the traditional hardbound textbooks like you and I had as, as students. And so what is uh, very commonplace is that we purchase the digital version for all students that they have access using their devices 24-7, um, and then we purchase uh, typically class sets 
uh, for uh, reference. And if the teacher needs to use a textbook to distribute to students for differentiation. Well, thank you for that. And I am aware that electronic versions are av available. I would suggest, and, and I, I would again ask, why some schools handed out textbooks and others did not. Is, was it just left up to the principal or the administration of each school to make those decisions? Yeah, I think that, they, oh, I, oh, go ahead, Ms. Dr. Roberts. No, I was gonna say, yeah, so, yeah. so Mr. Kuhn, with respect to the school-based decision-making, so as Dr. Boswell McCormick mentioned, so as curricula is written, um, it is digitized in terms of the resources and the access to school would be and where our curricula live. Uh, it does provide an opportunity, it did provide an opportunity to your question in terms of some schools giving out some materials and others. Schools did have an instructional material distribution, so working in concert with our staffing curriculum and instruction, teachers knowing and being the experts in their content and knowing um, what they're teaching. For example, one English teacher in a school may teach a novel that, uh, from a list of novels provided in the curriculum, a teacher in one school may teach it, um, and another teacher may not, may choose another novel from there. And again, those novels may be able to be accessed through the devices, which we know all students have. And also sometimes in their cases with, um, there were, it could be just a class set of resources. So schools had to make decisions in terms of what to give out based on equity, making sure all students on a particular grade level, a particular course, were able to access that material. But also knowing, going back to Dr. Boswell's McComas statement that, um, the majority of materials are available digitized, um, so that's the direction that most of our schools went. But there were cases, as you mentioned, where certain hardback materials could be given uh, based on the content, based on the group, and based on the availability um, of the material. Mary, I'm sorry, I, I, I cut you off. I didn't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Uh, no, that's okay. That's I was just going to say there's always discretion um, given different communities um, and different community needs. Um, I am glad, Mr. Kuhn, that you were able to um, ask and then get the support um, that you preferred the textbook, the hard version versus the digital. Um, I will say that, you know, all families that they should certainly reach out if they have a, a need or the, a preference uh, to that. And I will just also, um, just for the good of the community, um, like to also add that some of our, I shouldn't say some, but many of our digital resources come with um, additional features. So they have translation features, they have read aloud features and, and um, functions that also uh, can support uh, different learning needs and uh, differentiation as well. So I hope that I was able to answer your question in its entirety and, and support anybody else out in the community who might be wondering or need support. Well, thank you. Thank you. We, we continue to have discussions about books. I've brought this up during budget discussions and questions, and um, I fully understand that e-books are easy to distribute and <laughs> they um, have a lower cost point. But um, again, and uh, as a parent that was trying to help my stats, my AP stats student last night, I was trying to use a book online and I'll tell you, it's extremely frustrating. And I would suggest that those are important references that should definitely be made available to students. And if you could definitely get that message out to administrators across the entire system that when requested books need to be provided, I would extremely, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. King. I have one final question. I will question. never turn down buying books. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, because you and I Thank will definitely you. continue to talk about that. Yes, um, sir. Thank you. So regarding uh, one of the questions, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping topics here, but when we talk about um, elementary school and participation and, um, and kids being able to attend school, um, if... I have a, a situational question that I hope someone can answer for me. If a child only shows up for specials for a day or multiple days, what is being reported to the board about their attendance? Are they counted as attending for the day? Mr. Kuhn, this is Dr. Williams. I think we will have to follow up on that question that was raised previously. And with the guidance from the State Department of Education, uh, we've been following that. But I think we're going to have to follow up to those specific situations happening 
Um, like you said, students are showing up for specials and then how that's being recorded. Um, that will be a follow up. Well, thank you, Dr. Williams. And now, uh, Ms. Pestor. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the presentations. Um, and I just have um, one tied question among several of you. First of all, Dr. Scriven, uh, thank you for addressing some of the questions about um, uh, technology. Uh, they still, as you pointed out, do plague us in some ways. Um, it was good, and I'll be able to go back and deliver the word that uh, folks are still working on um, making sure that any problems are corrected. Um, as late as Sunday, however, I did hear from a parent who's had um, no success. So her child has been without um, the technology since school open and has not received any support. Um, I did ask her for some very um, specific details with names so I can share that with you. But the problem is that, and I use this case, but there are probably households that might well be similar. Um, there are six children of different ages in the household, which means there's no space or opportunity, if you will, to be able to use someone else's. Um, and as Mr. Kuhn talks about textbooks, um, you can see where now that becomes a problem. So we're bridging it because now we have no technology uh, to use to do the work on different levels. So it's just a number of things that we might not always process. Um, so I wanted to share that because I am absolutely certain um, that there are other families, whether there are a number of children or even two, that might still find themselves in that situation. So I just want to hear, what can first line should any of us be saying? Contact the school? Um, should we be sending that information to you? It becomes overwhelming for the parent who's trying to be teacher um, for several, or even teacher for one, handling technology, needing textbooks, or feeling that they need the resources. What is the best way? What's the message uh, we should be giving in terms of how to rectify some of these problems? So the there's a process where they can submit a ticket um, which does put them in a holding pattern. So let's be clear. Uh, if that is not successful, and you know being a formal principal just like myself, if, if I'm contacted by a family, then I have an avenue to get it done. So I would strongly encourage them to contact the school. The school will work with the executive director, the community superintendent, who definitely will get in touch with our side of 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 the of the shop to make sure that mm. we address, especially an extenuating circumstance like that when you have six children in in one family. So, um, and then you know, there's always uh, if you contact me directly, I'm I'm going to address it. So um, that that's not a problem, and that's to any uh, member who may be experiencing um, those barriers. All right, and I thank you for that. Um, Dr. McComas, I must just address it to you, and then you can, this next question. Um, thank you, Dr. Scriven. And yes, uh, Dr. McComas, you can um, share it with whomever. Uh, I'll, I'll bridge from the piece I just shared with Dr. Scriven, um, but there may be other circumstances. So we know that this child is going to be behind. Um, we, we see that just by the circumstance. So we may see as 
we're trying to get the technology together or whatever is happening. As we are quickly now approaching that date when um, our children will be going back, and I'm not talking about those special schools, but we're getting to that point. And we don't want our children, and certainly we are approaching um, a, a grading marking period. So what would you suggest? How do we... Uh, how do we advocate for our young people who, for what reason, one reason or another, mainly not for them, have uh, them uh, because of, of, of something that they've done, find themselves moving further and further back? Um, what can we do in this interim period so that we can be assured that when they are back face-to-face, -face, that they are going to feel good about that experience. As always, Ms. Pastor, you ask profound and, and compelling questions. So I, I, I would truly say that, you know, we are layering in multiple uh, tiers of support, right? And so first and foremost, I would share with you that we have done extensive work on the curriculum using and, and, and developing and embedding diagnostic tasks for our teachers to be able to very quickly identify where is that unfinished learning, if you will, what are those critical pathways to on-ramp a student to this year's learning standard um, in the most efficient way. In addition to that sort of being a primary layer of support, um, we are fortunate. We have been able to um, bring on, if you recall back to our August um, meetings, we were able to bring on tutoring resources um, to layer in another support um, that we can add as an extra layer to support students. It's going to be really critical into the spring semester that we continue to provide multiple layers of support. And quite genuinely, I would um, suggest that we need to continue to provide extensive supports even throughout next summer for students. Uh, because as you point out, each student's case is going to, to vary uh, in, in a sense of what their experience has been, um, to what extent has their family been impacted by COVID, um, to what extent is their own individual neurology um, maybe accelerating or, or struggling. Um, and so, Ms. Pesher, it is a complicated question that you pose. Um, and, and genuinely, the best response I can give you is that we know that we have built out and, and will continue to analyze how to provide multiple tiers of the systems of support for our students. And that that really needs to be, um, I know people get tired of me saying this, but we need to look at each of each child to figure out what exactly is the layer of support that they need. Um, Dr. McCullough, thank you for that answer. And, I, you know, I, I like to stay in my, my what space, um, but <laughs> may I suggest that since we are doing, I'm going to call it virtually live, okay, um, the, because the children now do have teachers, that that's our starting point, so we don't have to wait until the children come back that those, certainly those teachers will know um, already who the children are. They're getting ready to, to grade them. So they will know who some of the children are who are struggling. They will also know those children um, who, like this last child, um, have not been on for some time. Now, this is a, a very assertive mother, so I am certain that this parent has made it clear that there are issues. But still, there will, will be that gap. So I'm just hopeful that um, as we're moving forward, we're also having those discussions with our teachers and at school-based administrators asking for some names and areas uh, where uh, some weaknesses have been seen so that when we see them face-to-face, -face, we are a little better prepared. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes. My, uh, I have a concern about uh, when, when we come back to uh, 
in-person instruction. Uh, is there plans to do specific training for, uh, for, for social emotional issues uh, when, when students come back who, who may be uh, concerned or, or afraid of, uh, of the possibility of, of, of you know of, of having uh, of having having health issues? Uh, is there any specific training that, that, that we're doing with uh, with uh, with staff, either the classroom teachers and or guidance and or other other uh, other school based people to try to uh, try to prepare for this? Thank you. So yes, yes, Mr. Offerman, we have um, at the beginning of the year provided specific professional learning related to understanding the social emotional needs um, based in our COVID context. We continue to customize and build out professional learning to support social emotional uh, needs um, throughout the semester and, and that will continue throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. And board members, I would just uh, alert us to uh, that we are running quite behind and that if board members can um, make their questions and comments and then the um, Dr. Williams can have staff follow up with us additionally, not just to the board members, but also uh, to find a public way to answer these questions um, for our stakeholders. So with that, Mr. Mahamza. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I, I'm going to cut some of my questions down to just ask the important ones. Uh, so in terms of the uh, sports season, um, the announcement, I believe it was it last week, I, I was still, I'm still, uh, I don't understand. Uh, when they say sports can reopen, are they talking about the season? And would that mean if we don't reopen, uh, we would not be able to participate in any like state competitions or any other competition that is run by uh, MPSSAA. I think I learned that right. Um, so would that affect our sports competitions? So thank you, Mr. Mahamza, for that. I think it would be best if I um, have the committee um, put into writing what are those implications. Uh, the announcement, um, in short, allowed school systems to make adjustments to their plan. Um, and to begin competitive seasons in the fall if they so chose to. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's probably the most brief response I can give you at this point. And I, I'll work uh, with Dr. Williams, of course, to try to provide a more detailed response for you, given the, the time. Thank okay. you. And I, I do also hope that uh, you guys uh, discuss, oh, I believe what Ms. Hager, Dr. Hager mentioned about allowing sports uh, to condition in person, I think that'll be a great step forward if the virtual, uh, the in-person uh, season doesn't uh, happen. Um, my other question has to deal with the SATs. Um, can is the does the county have the fiscal capabilities to provide uh, free SATs to the people to all students? So historically. Yeah, historically, we have provided the SAT day uh, where the cost is covered for our students. That is part of the um, analysis, if you will, uh, that our team is working through uh, because um, the conditions are so different this year. So, but I will just tell you, historically, we have been able to do that. We've been very fortunate to offer our uh, school day SAT um, free to our, our students. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of like uh, the cancer test, um, I guess does College Board refund this? Uh, the, the refund the money that uh, students uh, spent uh, signing up for the test that were canceled or were not able to take it? Yes. If um, if the students had signed up for a site and that site was canceled, the College Board would uh, work through their standard refund process. I don't personally know all the details of the College Board uh, fine print, but that would uh, undoubtedly be part of their practice. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, my last question is for, um, I believe it was Mr. Sanders, about the devices. Uh, 
Mr. Saris, I think you might have mentioned this, but I think I missed it. Uh, the new devices you saw, you said uh, were uh, delivered. Were, were they rented or like were they bought? I think you might have mentioned this. I just I must have forgot. Okay, Josh, I don't, I don't think that was Mr. Saris. That was probably me, Dr. Scriven. Uh, Scriven, that, sorry. That was speaking to that. That's okay. Yeah. Um, can you uh, restate your question around the devices? No, no new devices have been uh, delivered yet, but the bulk delivery that we are expecting are going to be devices which we have actually purchased, and they are not leased devices. Okay, yeah, that, that was my question because I, okay. I know I, I believe that the devices that we have now that we've had for like the last couple of years that they're uh, leased, right? Y yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Good afternoon or evening. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that presentation. I have one question, but it's one that I believe is on a lot of stakeholders' minds. And that is, um, this period of virtual learning feels indefinite to most stakeholders. It's marked by uncertainty. Individuals are un uncomfortable. It's marked by a lack of information, discomfort, and fear. My questions are, how and specifically when will we move from this place of uncertainty to one of information, confidence, and certainty? And what would you say to stakeholders to reassure them that the school system's focus is on a safe return to in-person instruction? So Ms. Sen, I'll, I'll try to respond. I, I, I think for the virtual learning, this is Dr. Williams, that the, the collaboration and work with the local school and the school leadership to, to try to mitigate the concerns or questions are, that's the first step that our, our school staff and our leaders um, have been really working hard to make virtual learning a reality. Um, in terms of the uncertainty and fear um, as we go through this year, we will continue to work with our health department. Um, we don't know um, later on this in this year or this semester what the conditions may be. Um, we will continue to communicate what we know or next steps. Um, and so I, I think what what we can say is our COVID-19 workforce, our, our collaboration with the Department of Health, um, they've been great partners to help guide us. The, um, the metrics um, that were presented uh, from the state. So, you know, if I, folks wanna know that um, we are collaborating, we're communicating, and then that we're looking at the safety measures and whatever we do um, to make sure we are preventing um, or lessening any any situation. So I, I think right now that's a big question. along as we know more information. Um, it's kind of like what happened in the spring. The more information we receive, we responded to. Um, so thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And thank you for mentioning the work because we know that a lot of outstanding work is happening. We know how hard individuals are working behind the scenes. What would provide a lot of reassurance is some insight into that work and some visibility into that work. Because as I mentioned, that uncertainty, that fear is brought through the absence of information. And individuals are looking for reassurance that the school system's focus is on the return to in-person instruction, especially for the families of our most vulnerable learners 
for whom virtual learning is not working. They want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. They want to see that our focus is on returning to school. They want to see that steps are being made to um, make sure our schools are safe. Our teachers want to be back with their kids. They want to see what steps we're taking. And there's a void in the information that's being provided. So my question, you know, about re what would you say to them to reassure them that that, that is our focus? Um, can you elaborate on your response to that beyond what you've you've already commented? Well, again, it is it is the work that we're doing with our design team and the desire to make sure we are providing updates as to what we know and how we're trying to move forward. Um, again, um, that's been kind of the work that we learned back in the spring, and that is the goal that we constantly provide some kind of update uh, as we're moving through this timeline of first semester, what this may look like. And so it is our commitment to constantly work with our design team, our stakeholder groups, and the COVID-19 task force to provide updates when appropriate. And do you have a target goal for when the board might expect to see a more detailed timeline um, or return plan? Not that that would be in stone, but a, a target draft timeline? Um, we are. We were modifying and looking at the feedback. We're getting the surveys, so we have. We're surveying our students, um, having uh, focus groups with staff, um, as we mentioned earlier, as it was mentioned earlier, um, with the small population of students we want to look at, um, and so it's fluid right now. But I would say um, we should have a modified tentative plan. Again, I must echo, it is tentative, is likely to change based on more data that we receive and more information and then guidance from our health department. And I don't, and, I don't want to overpromise the board, no, but we'll constantly will provide updates. Of course. And, and when is that tenant, a tentative date for that plan expected? When did you say that would be expected? We are looking at gathering, so we're gathering survey, we're doing a survey for our, for our families, so that's October 2nd through the 9th. Um, and then we're working with staff to address questions as much as we can. And so um, we were looking at a November time frame, um, but again, that is, that, that is still up in the air as we continue to look at the data that we're receiving. Thank you. And and the board meets on the 13th, so I will be requesting an, an update on it um, at that meeting. But thank you for that information. Um, that's all I had, Madam Chair. And Ms. Joes, I, I will go last. So, Ms. Joes? No, thank you. So, no, com no comments, Ms. Joes? Yes, just thank you for the information, Dr. McComas. Um, no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McMillian. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, great. Uh, I know I get, ex I got one comment to make. I know I get excited and I speak fast and I'm loud, but I'm gonna try to slow down so people can hear what I say. Uh, as a lot of you know, I'm a retired physical education teacher and athletic director. I'm 22 months removed from working as the athletic director for 25 years at Chesapeake High School. If I had not won the election, I had hoped to still be working as an athletic director. Therefore, I'm very much aware of the dozens of variables affecting the live start of fall athletics. I can give 100% of my support to the committee analyzing these very, very topics. I would like to thank all of the members of the com committee, all 24 athletic directors, Mr. Sy, Ms. Mitzel, Mr. Cressman, and Ms. Marston in the Office of Athletics, and all of our approximately 1,800 year-round coaches. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Ms. Mack? 
Um, yes, thank you, um, Ms. Causey. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Ms. Hen said, and then I have a question about SATs. Um, in, in the thousands of emails that we received in the speakers that we heard tonight, I hear frustration and fear that I think could be ameliorated somehow if we did provide more specificity. I think people want to know, um, have we inventoried our schools? Do we know what condition our um, HVAC is in? Do we have filters that will filter out um, as much of the air particles as they can? Which one of our schools have windows that open um, versus windows that don't open? Because we could, um, we could open windows to at least get fresh air in there. Um, when, when will we talk about how much PPE we have um, and how teachers will use it and whether we'll hand it out for students and that type of thing. And then like specific questions, um, I have teachers say to me all the time, if I'm willing to return to school and 20 of my 27 students are willing to return to school, how can I distance safely distance those 20 kids in my very small classroom. So I guess I'm echoing what Ms. Hen said. I think the more information that we can provide, the greater our ability to allay the concerns that people have because we will be going back to school at some point and we hopefully will have the virus under control, but we need to be able to say to people that we will keep you and we will keep our students safe. And I think there's some missing pieces there and I don't need an answer. I just wanted to make that comment. We do have a concern about the SATs. It's been a number of years since I managed that process with my own children. But what are we not impacting children's uh, students' ability to apply for colleges if we do not have SATs soon. I know, Dr. McComas, you said that there's a committee that's looking at this, but I know other school systems are offering SATs, and I think we're disadvantaging our students if we don't have a plan that comes up with SAT days soon for our students so that we give them the data they need to get into the colleges to which they're applying. So I'll just very quickly, Ms. Mack, say that I do hear your concern. That is why we have a committee that is exploring what is, what is the possibilities and how do we provide opportunity for our seniors safely. I will uh, say that there is tremendous um, flexibility occurring this year at the college level around admissions and, and um, not necessarily requiring SAT as they have done traditionally. Uh, that of course varies college by college, uh, but um, we are seeing uh, tremendous flexibility in the college application this year um, related to SAT. Nevertheless, however, we are uh, seeking to, to um, figure out how to provide opportunity for our seniors should they find themselves applying to a college that is, has less flexibility this year. So we too do understand um, the urgency and importance of it. Um, and that's part of why we are working to, to figure that out to support them. So thank and you as always, have, Ms. Mack. Do we have a, a date by which we'll have an answer uh, as what we're gonna do with our seniors this year? I do not have a date for you right now. And do you, will you be providing an update in the next board meeting? I will be working with Dr. Williams to provide updates. And so rather that is in a board meeting or a weekly update or how to, in whatever format, um, we, I always work through Dr. Williams for, because we know that there's many things happening all the time. And I just have one more point and then I'm finished. Are we disadvantaging our students? I know you said many colleges are being flexible and everybody needs to be flexible in this time of COVID, but when other school systems are offering SATs and their students are applying to the same schools that our students are applying to, and our students have not taken the SATs, are we disadvantaging them? Ms. Mack, your, your question is really posed from the college level. So if I were a college admissions director, would I disadvantage a child who does not have SAT because they lived in a COVID uh, saturated environment compared to a child who did not and had the SAT? 
I cannot answer how a college admissions person would compare uh, those two different scenarios. I can say that we are working to figure out an opportunity for our seniors so that um, they would have um, to be able to put that on the table um, if they were in a college uh, that was not exercising flexibility. All right, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. So um, I, I'm just gonna jump in here because this has been a, a, a consistent issue amongst all the board members just to clarify some issues. There are districts right next door to us that are implementing SATs within their buildings for their seniors on October 14th. College board has um, college board has committed to getting a uh, test scored within two weeks. They have committed to uh, doing the score with the writing. Um, excuse me, the test provide okay, with the writing um, shortly after that. So the answer is it is being done. It can be done in Maryland. It is not up to the Board of Education and the Baltimore County Public Schools to rely on the compassion of college admission agents. It is our duty to provide for our students according to our policy 0100 equity to give our students what they need to be successful. And if what they need to be successful to compete at a high level for colleges or because maybe they've had medical illnesses that have not given them the grade point average or the opportunity to move forward with rigor and their SAT score is going to make the difference, yes, we are not doing the best by our children if we do not provide this opportunity. I am confident that Dr. McComas and that team can provide this opportunity for our children. So I would just like to say that we look forward to hearing um, more from Dr. McComas and Dr. Williams about how we are going to provide for our children uh, what they need. So we're gonna move on, um, Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is, and um, again, one, I think that the um, athletics has been thoroughly uh, vetted and spoken about by um, Dr. Hager, um, Joshua Mahomza, and also by Rod McMillian. So thank you for that. My question is in regards to, to the device ratio. I know that um, this current board, um, one of the decisions that we that this board made was to reduce the student device ratio for children in grades K through or kindergarten through third to five to one. And um, what I'm wondering is because Dr. Scriven spoke about the devices and ordering devices, but what I'd like to know is how that will factor in once our students return back to schools, as has been talked about, um, returning back to the schoolhouse. Will that device reduction ratio go into effect? And if so, what is the timeline for that? Because we now, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course no one could have foreseen that, but um, nevertheless, we are um, reliant upon uh, devices and remote learning. So I am curious as to if the team has some, um, some information they could share with us um, as to how that will impact our students when we return to the schoolhouse. Will that device reduction ratio immediately go into effect? And as we talk about equity, and as was so eloquently said as far as the SAT and um, things like that, and making sure that, that our children are, are taking care of that aspect, I wanna make sure that our youngest children are, and our earliest learners um, uh, are also taken care of. So I guess that would be a question for um, Dr. Scriven. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So thank you for the question. We are poised that once we receive our outstanding devices, uh, we will be able to provide uh, K through 12 a one-to-one -one ratio. So um, the, that that's the short and sweet of it. I'm sorry. So although um, a decision for this board was to reduce that, for K through three to five to one, um, upon returning back, you're saying that students will still have the one-to-one -one ratio. And, and, unless the board deemed to keep a five to one. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
So uh, going back to decisions made by the board related to the operating budget and uh, device ratios, uh, the board did support the um, superintendent's recommendation for the device ratio at the time, uh, which was before the pandemic. So certainly the board will consider Dr. Williams uh, when we are in the recovery mode, uh, evaluating what is the best path forward for the school system and for the students, given the resources that we currently have. So thank you. Um, and Ms. Rowe. Yes, hi, I have a few questions. Um, Ms. Rowe, it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so one of the questions I have is some students have purchased their own devices and if we're short of devices, are we considering asking students who have devices at home to return school system devices if they're not using them at all? Uh, Ms. Rowe, can you, you can you that? restate that question one more time, please? So some of the um, children have purchased their own devices. And since we're short on devices, have we considered asking um, students who have their own devices to return the school system devices if they're not using them at all? The, that is something that we have not considered uh, at this point. Uh, but would definitely be worth investigating if that indeed is the is the uh, is the case. Okay, and Ms. McComas, will you clarify? Are students reading novels and textbooks on the screen in addition to all the screen time for classes when they could have physical books? Hi, Ms. Rowe. Thank you for that question. It's a combination. So. Um, that we do have um, novels and uh, available digitally, but they also have hard copies. And so that can really come down to a learner preference. Okay, and this is my last question. What recommendations or guidance has the Baltimore County Department of Health made before schools can safely begin to reopen? And does the health department agree with reopening the four special education schools and with what safety measures? I think that's a, a broader question than just for me. Um, we do confer uh, with the yeah. health department all the time. Dr. Zarchin. Yes. So we meet regularly with the Department of Health for Baltimore County. Uh, in our task force meetings, we address uh, concerns for safety as they come up. Um, and that, that group meets every week. And part of our work is planning, looking at details. We are now looking at uh, planning visits, not only to the four schools, but other offices and schools to do mitigation checks to give feedback on practices, uh, what, what's being done well and what can be done to improve mitigation practices. Okay, so the health department is involved in this entire process? We have worked with the Department of Health for Baltimore County uh, every step of the way since we, uh, since we left in March. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Zurchin. And um, as I said that I uh, was saving um, my comments till the end, and what I'm going to do is just run down a list of information that I think based on the input that the board has received in thousands of emails, the public comment that we heard tonight, and um, also additional uh, questions from um, board members. Um, one, I would like to see uh, answered in a public fashion the uh, concerns and comments addressed this evening by our uh, chair of the Special Education Citizen Advisory Council uh, concerns. Um, we have also received a number of emails from parents around special education concerns, so I would like to see those answers. Um, and I would like to see maybe a frequently asked question uh, section. I know that we had that, Dr. Williams, before, where parents can go and see answers to uh, real questions. I'd also like to see uh, being addressed to the 
gifted and talented Citizens Advisory Council. Um, I did want to say um, we are doing better, and I am so pleased, Dr. Scrivens, with um, the improved help desk calls, the work tickets. Um, that is the key for um, equitable access for our students, is to have the access to technology. So thank you for those tremendous results. Yes, um, ma'am. The um, sports are obviously a big concern, but also what has been mentioned or was not mentioned, but I know that board members and parents and teachers who are involved in these activities are concerned about is those extracurriculars for our students. Not all students are involved in sports. Uh, some students are involved in robotics, coding, uh, student government, all of these other um, opportunities, these clubs that they have, to have those connections, something where they can find joy, feel normal. Um, so I would like to see also in your return to play uh, committee that there is also a corollary in terms of uh, returning to extracurriculars. Um, and I was very encouraged to hear from our um, our uh, CTE representative about the small cohorts getting back into uh, the CTE programs, because we do. We have specialized equipment for those students uh, to learn the skills that they need to advance. Um, additionally, um, I wanted to thank, along with Dr. Scrivens, the schoolhouse leaders and families for making these differences. Um, and lastly, we have, thank you, Dr. Williams, for the updates that you are providing to the board. You had uh, showed us the design team and the COVID response team membership, and I would suggest that you add a few um, more folks to those. Um, I saw only one principal at uh, the high school level, and while that's phenomenal, I think it's also very important to have a middle school principal, an elementary school principal. I also think it's important to have someone on that design team. I did not see uh, Mr. Michael Sai or someone else that is uh, specifically focused on that um, athletic portion and someone that is focused on those extracurriculars. Um, I would also recommend having a parent, um, a couple parents, sport booster, PTA president, um, to really round that out um, in terms of garnering all of the experience, passion, and perspectives that we have, because we have received a tremendous amount of input, and we want to respect that, we want to value it, and we want to use it, and we want to let people know how we are using it. So thank you for that. And we are now going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the report on the opening of schools, and, excuse me, the uh, report on the 2019-2020 student performance report. And for that, we have Dr. McComas and Dr. Wheatley Phillips. So thank you. Good evening. Um, we're just waiting for the PowerPoint to load. Good evening. Thank you. So good evening, Chairwoman Cosby, Vice Chair and Superintendent William and members of the board. Tonight we present the annual student performance report. Next slide, please. Tonight's presentation was developed to serve two key purposes, to provide you with an update on performance trends and gaps, and through this analysis, explicitly connect the data with systemic initiatives, priorities, and action steps that were developed to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare our students for the future. While much data will be shared, this is a fluid process because in this COVID era and during the first month of school, many decisions are still evolving and will be made in response to conditions that unfold. For this report, we utilize the data that were available given the many assessments that were canceled in response to the impact of COVID-19 and the closing of schools. There may be questions that linger, and so we have developed and provided for the board a written executive summary that is aligned with this presentation, and we will follow up as directed by Dr. Williams. Next slide, please. The Compass, our pathway to excellence, is organized into five focus areas. The goals, key initiatives, and strategies provide for our students a foundation for equity and access, opportunity, and achievement. The targets and measures provide benchmarks for progress monitoring and feedback for continuous improvement. Next slide, please. There are many types of assessments. Formative assessments provide short cycle feedback 
and ongoing support during the learning process. Summative assessments provide systemic analysis of learning after longer intervals. Next slide, please. In comparing assessments, there are norm reference assessments which tell us how students perform who are at the same age or grade level. There are also criterion reference assessments which compare achievement to a standard or pre-established benchmark. Both provide data and contribute to a body of evidence used in making high-level decisions. Next slide, please. As you know, the state of Maryland replaced the park assessments in the past two years. MSDE created an umbrella of assessments under the MCAP name. While the tests vary by content area, they all fall under the MCAP name. There's an entire suite of MCAP assessments. The KRA assessments are given to all incoming kindergarten students and provide us with a measure of kindergarten readiness. There are also alternate assessments. Can you bring me a flashlight? There are also alternate assessments, which are state assessments in ELA, math, and science that are administered to students with cognitive disabilities who are unable to participate in the MCAP assessments, even with accommodations. For our English learners, the Access for ELS assessments, which are given to all ESOL students in K-12 and measure English language proficiency in listening, speaking, reading, writing, oral comprehension, and literacy. The MISA integrated state assessments are given in grades five and eight, and they help us measure student achievement in science. The following four assessments are high school testing requirements for graduation. The English language arts ELA assessments are given in grades three through eight and grade 10. The math assessments are given in grades three through eight and at the end of algebra one. The high school government assessment is given at the end of US government. The high school MISA is a state science assessment which is given at the end of the life science course. This is a high school testing requirement for graduation and has replaced HSA biology. In addition to state, to state MCAP assessment, BCPS requires students in grades K through eight to take the measures of academic progress or map reading and math assessments. These assessments provide us with valuable information on how progressing year. With the map assessments, we get immediate results and the assessments allow us to see how our BCPS students are doing in comparison to a national group of students. Next slide, please. As you know, the testing landscape for the 1920 school year unfolded very differently than anticipated. We administered the MAP assessments, which provided standardized growth and achievement data for students in kindergarten through grade eight. These assessments show that students in, in grades K through five have had relatively consistent achievement at or above the 61st percentile over the last three years in both reading and math. The winter map reading and math data for all elementary students when compared by student group indicate that the greatest gaps in achievement are evident among five main student groups. Students who are English learners, students receiving special education services, students who are Hispanic, students who receive free and reduced meal services, and students who are black or African American. While our math data show the same gaps across the same student groups as with our reading data, in the area of math, fewer students are performing at or above the 61st percentile compared to reading. The total number of test takers in reading was 51,141, while the number in math was 51,655. Next slide, please. When we examined the math achievement data for students in grades six through eight, students have demonstrated relatively consistent performance with a slight decrease in the percentage of students at or above the 61st percentile over the last three years. Math winter reading and math data for all middle school students when compared by student group, indicate the greatest gaps in achievement are evident with the same five student groups. For all students who completed the MAP math assessments, typically one third less 
demonstrated achievement at or above the 61st percentile compared to their performance in reading. Next slide, please. The information on this slide provides the number of years students are enrolled to receive English language learner services at the elementary level. The acronym ACCESS stands for Assessing Comprehension and Communication in English State-to-State -State for English Language Learners. The ACCESS assessment is administered annually to determine students' level of language attainment in a number of domains, which include listening, speaking, reading, and writing. English learners, including those who have waived ESOL programming supports, are assessed annually until they meet the proficiency level of 4.5. There are six language proficiency levels, entering, emerging, developing, expanding, bridging, and reaching. An examination of the total number of test takers shows there has been an annual increase in the number of students assessed by ACCESS annually. There has been an increase of over 1,000 students between the 1718 and 1819 school years taking the ACCESS assessment. This positive trend mirrors the overall enrollment increase for English learners. Not only are more students taking the assessment, but the data indicate across the elementary grade levels that students typically demonstrate higher levels of English language proficiency in the intermediate grades. Next slide, please. The information on this slide includes the number of years students are enrolled to receive services at the middle school level. Across, all, across grade levels, there has been an increase in the percentage of English learners earning a composite score of four or higher. In the 1920 school year, Fewer English learners in grades six through eight earned a composite score level of four or higher compared with the previous two years. As students meet the proficiency level of 4.5 or higher on access, they are considered to have exited and no longer required to take this access assessment. An examination of the total number of test takers shows there has been an annual increase in the number of students assessed by access annually. There has been an increase of over 400 students between the 1718 and 1819 school years taking access. This positive trend mirrors the overall enrollment increase for English learners. Next slide, please. The information on this slide tells the number of students enrolled to receive services at the secondary level, specifically grades 9 through 12. Across grade levels, English learners demonstrated higher levels of English language proficiency in grades 11 and 12. It is important to note that the grade 11 and 12 English learner groups have fewer students in each cohort compared to the cohort sizes in grades 9 and 10. These data are reflective of the dropout rates that are higher for English learners compared to all other student groups. An examination of the total number of test takers shows there has been an annual increase in the number of students assessed by ACCESS annually, specifically over 400 students between the 1718 and 1819 school years taking the ACCESS assessment. Next slide, please. In consideration of our commitment to college and career readiness, which is outlined in the compass, BCPS's four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate has exceeded Maryland in the 1617, 1718, and 1819 school years. The four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate provides a measure of the percentage of students that successfully completed high school in four years with a regular high school diploma. The term adjusted cohort means students who entered grade nine plus any students who transfer into the cohort in grades 9 and 12, minus any students who are removed from the cohort because they transferred out, moved out of the country, or were deceased. There are three student groups whose four-year adjusted cohort graduation rates have exceeded 88% since 1617. They are Asian, African-American, and or Black, 
and our white students. While there is still much needed improvement, the graduation rates for English learners and students receiving special education services have been steadily increasing since 1617. However, for our Hispanic or Latino students and students eligible for free and reduced meal prices, I'm sorry, free and reduced price meals, our farm students, we've seen a decline in graduation rates over the past three years. The four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate for 1920 school year will not be available until after the February state board meeting. Next slide, please. CCR is a measure of college and career readiness mandated by the College and Career Readiness and College Completion Act of 2013. This act requires Maryland to prepare all students for college and careers upon graduation from high school. Students can meet CCR for both ELA and math by meeting criteria set forth in the MSDE CCR toolkit. For our students who exited grade 12, a higher percentage of BCPS exiting 12th graders earned a CCR ELA designation than in math. More than 70% of our Asian and white students earned the CCR ELA designation in the 1819 school year. The percentage of Hispanic Latino students earning the CCR ELA designation has increased 4.9 percentage points between 1617 and the 1819 school years. Our African American black students have seen a 6.9% percentage point increase during the same period. Students receiving free and reduced price meals have shown a steady increase of 8.2 percentage points since the 1617 school year. It is important to note that the 1920 data are not yet available. Additionally, due to the COVID-19 related school closures, certain assessments were not administered, including SAT day for 11th graders, and MCAP ELA 10 in the spring of 2020. Next slide, please. For our students who exited grade 12, math continues to be an area of focus as there have been declines in the percentage of existing 12th graders who earned CCR math designation across all student groups and overall between the 1617 and 1819 school years. While the data show a decline from 7,000 372 to 7,128 students over a three-year span, the student groups who increased in exiting counts are Hispanic and English learners. In the next slides, Dr. Boswell McComas will describe how we are working to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare our students for colleges or careers. Next slide, please. Dr. McComas. Yes, thank you. Could I get the next slide? Thank you. We are striving to raise the bar despite the global pandemic. And as parents and board members, you remain committed to ensuring that we have a strategic pathway to excellence. You would like to know and have confidence in how we will proceed to address both immediate and long-term system improvements. I will share with you how we are raising expectations while at the same time closing gaps and preparing our students for their future success in college and ultimately in their careers. Last year, we revised the Baltimore County uh, Public Schools Teaching and Learning Framework, as Ms. Byers uh, referenced earlier to that, to this evening. And this sets forth uh, our learning accountability and results. And specifically, uh, what do we believe about teaching and learning in BCPS? And based on those beliefs, what are our expectations for daily instruction? And ultimately, what qualitative and quantitative evidence will we collect and monitor to measure progress towards meeting those expectations? We know and have strengthened our focus on standards-based, high-quality initial instruction through a combination of actions, such as investing in ESSA-rated, high-quality, evidence-based instructional materials that support foundational literacy, such as open court, and disciplinary literacy, such as our reading apprenticeship, and that support foundational math, uh, mathematics, such as our bridges materials. We additionally have invested in professional learning to support calibration to standards across all grade levels and content areas. And we have expanded dual enrollment opportunities with colleges and universities. 
Ultimately, our system improvement teams will continue to guide our progress through research and innovation, ensuring that progress is not merely sustained, but truly accelerated. Next slide, please. As we begin a new school year and re-engage with our students and families, we are mindful of the impact of COVID-19 upon all facets of our lives. We renew our commitment to closing our gaps through our work to design equitable structures and systems that promote access and opportunity for all of our students. We know that the work will at times be challenging and we believe that we will overcome those challenges. We are focused on identifying gaps and implementing targeted programs and responsive interventions to supplement high quality first instruction. Specifically, we never stopped offering instructional supports through the multi-tiered system of academic support offered in our summer programs as described in our last board meeting. And furthermore, we've leveraged research from the New Teacher Project to guide our work in developing diagnostic tasks embedded in each core content and grade level to support teachers in identifying that critical path related to standards performance in order to accelerate learning rather than to be caught up in a default deficit model. This serves as our real-time data in the form of student work products that drives individual and small group instructional strategies and supports. Systemically, our schools are supported with the same approach through the instructional core team that coordinates resources to address specific school strengths and needs, also earlier discussed this evening by Dr. Roberts. Lastly, we will continue implementing our math audit recommendations through the piloting of robust resources to support mathematics modeling, such as Desmos, and, the, and we will continue um, vetting Algebra 1 resources. Additionally, we are working with MSDE to audit our ELA curriculum and currently anticipate that report in late April or early May. Next slide, please. Thank you. We are focused on the Compass Air Pathway to Excellence as our strategic plan for accomplishing our goals and our priorities. We are committed to providing all students with access and opportunities to achieve at high levels while choosing a variety of pathways to demonstrate college and career readiness. As you can see on the screen, we engage in preparing our students for their future in a multitude of ways ranging from annual long-term planning that begins in middle school to cultivating organizational and study skills in AVID to dual enrollment, dual degree, and professional credentialing programs reflected in CTE, magnet, military, and linguistics programs. Additionally, we will continue to explore opportunities um, and we are dedicated to our work as we embark on a new day of success for all of our students and staff in Baltimore County Public Schools. Next slide, please. Well, how will we accomplish our goal? The strategic plan is our compass for our pathway to excellence, and we will do this through deliberate and timely action that will accelerate our ability to achieve our goals. And so therefore we must interrupt and replace systemic and structural inequities. We must focus on highly effective collaboration, communication and implementation of our compass. We must prioritize our continuous improvement through the system improvement team and the core instructional team. We must recruit, hire, and support teachers through leadership and professional development initiatives. And ultimately, we must develop and enhance our family engagement programs and community partnerships. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Boswell McComas. At the onset of this report, I emphasize the role and importance of the COMPASS, our school system strategic plan, which has established targets and goals to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare students for the future. As Dr. Boswell McComas shared, our, under Dr. Williams' leadership, one of the ways in which we will accomplish this is through the work of the system improvement teams he has formulated. There are 12 interdisciplinary focus groups comprised of central office as well as school-based stakeholders. These leaders have been charged with the task of engaging in data analysis, thoughtful discussion, and an examination of current beliefs and practices. 
In addition to action planning, their work is viewed through the lens of equity, and recommendations will be based on current and effective research-based practices. These groups are convening and will provide ongoing updates. Central office teams have also developed office progress plans that are aligned with the compass and in schools are building leaders with the support of the DSSA team, the Division of School Support and Achievement, have developed school progress plans that are specific to the unique instructional and school climate needs of each school. As you know, the state testing landscape remains fluid as there are many uncertainties. Across divisions, teams have been collaborating and working to ensure that first and foremost, the social and emotional well-being of students remain our priority. At the December 8, 2020 board meeting, an update on focus area one, learning accountability and results will be given. We will inform the board of the most recent state and system assessment. In addition, in relation to focus area one of our strategic plan, we will provide an update on how we are monitoring progress towards the Compass's targets. Next slide, please. Tonight, our Executive Director of Performance Management and Assessment, Mr. Kevin Connolly, and Ms. Stacy Shack, our Director of Assessment, have joined us. We will provide any follow-up as directed by Dr. Williams. At this time, we welcome any feedback and comments from board members. Dr. Wheatley Phillips and Dr. McComas, I just wanna thank you for that wonderful presentation. While we are addressing the urgent and shifting uh, needs of our students and staff currently, we do have a tremendous amount of people focused on the future. Yes, we're in this situation now, but we will get out of it. And when we are there, we know that we can make tremendous progress by implementing uh, the compass. And uh, so we're grateful for that focus on the future. Um, at this time, I will ask board members if they can make, uh, I'm gonna request if they can just make a 30 second comment and any questions that they have uh, can be answered um, quickly or in, in the future, because we do have uh, additional reports, um, especially um, the report on the multi-year improvement plan. Uh, we have our consultant with us for that. So board members, uh, if you have a comment, uh, you can make it. We're not gonna go around the dais. Um, if you can just uh, raise your hand here, I can see you. You can make a comment, ask your questions, and um, then we can process forward. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Thank you very much, Dr. Wiki Phillip and Dr. Um, McComas. Um, for the last year, I have been asking for a more clear and um, a more clear differentiation between MAP and MCAP. And I appreciate the data that you provided tonight, but I still have a concern on how we share our data publicly. I'm looking at the dashboard for. Um, MCAP ELA grade three, which shows that 37.3% of our third graders are proficient in reading, but directly underneath of that percentage says um, MAP reading winter grade two is 49.8 and um, well, I'll leave it at the 49.8. I know from teachers that MAP is very important because it gives them real-time tools with which to provide differentiated instruction. But I am concerned that if I am a parent looking at our dashboard and I see third grade MCAP is 37.3 and immediately below that, where the topic is at academic achievement percent of students meeting or exceeding standards, I see 49.8. The question I'm gonna have as a parent is, how did we drop from 49.8 to 37.3 when in fact they're two entirely different measurements? So I would like to request that we show that differentiation um, more specifically. One is growth and one is proficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mapp. I, I'll have to take a look at the dashboard specifically to see that, but that that is noted and we will take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for your work and also thank you for raising the, the percentile level and I'll say this to Dr. Williams from 50 to 61. 
Um, I, you know, we all want our kids to be proficient and we want them to grow. And that is a step in the right direction. So thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you for sharing all this information. Um, I just have one question and I was hoping you could clarify when you were talking about graduation data, you mentioned that data for 1920 wouldn't be available until February. Could you please like, clarify or explain that answer? Absolutely. And so we have Ms. Stacey Shack, who's on the call with us. I'm just going to ask Ms. Shack if you could respond to that. Absolutely. Thank you guys for, thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, in general, MSDE releases most of their important assessment data at a state board meeting. In the past, that um, release of data has always come at either their January or their February state board meeting. Because um, MSD has to wait for all of the testing data to come through. We also have to provide them with a high school data collection file that they use to determine the cohort graduation rate. And that is due to them um, within the next week. So it takes them time to process the data. So once that data is shared at the February state board meeting, we'll be able to share um, the 1920 graduation rate with you. All right, thank you. Dr. Hager. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a quick comment and a quick question. I just wanted to thank you for the presentations, particularly thank you for showing the declines and showing the gaps in achievement within the county and not hiding behind that and putting it out there so that everyone can see kind of what the reality is right now. And I just wanna say that I am optimistic about this plan and the fact that we're thinking about equity and we're thinking about how to close these gaps. And um, so I wanna applaud you for that and uh, thank you for the presentation. And one thing that I've uh, thought about for a while with respect to closing achievement gaps has to do with summer learning loss. And I know that we did implement programs last summer, given the you know pandemic and everything that was happening, but um, what other uh, strategies are in the compass? And potentially this is a question for another day, including the possibility of adjusting the calendar to reduce the length of the summer um, or other approaches to uh, specifically address summer learning losses, which we know are a big component of the achievement gaps that we often see um, among school-aged children. So thank you so much for that question. I think that is a broader question and it truly is inclusive of all the things that we are working across BCPS to do to support all of the students. And as Dr. McComas shared earlier, learning doesn't just end um, at the end of the school year. We truly are looking at ways within which we can continue that learning over the summer. So we thank you so much for that comment because definitely thinking about ways within which we can continue to provide experiences for our students, we'll definitely continue to explore those. And thank you. Um, and that is uh, finishing up our board member comments and questions. And, and yes, we do appreciate Dr. Williams sharing the as is because it is by knowing the truth that we can do better by our kids. So thank you again for that. Um, our next item on the agenda is item K, report on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Um, and for that, we will uh, call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit to come forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Dixit, at this time, could you please uh, do introductions and set the framework? Thank you, Dr. Scriven, and good evening, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Han, and, and Dr. Williams and members of the board. As we have shared with you in the past, BCPS, in collaboration with Baltimore County, has been working with an independent consultant, uh, Canon Design, in the development of multi-year capital improvement plan for all schools. We call it my iPass. And since the inception of the plan, it has been a key objective of Dr. Williams and the county executive and their teams for the process to be so totally transparent, collaborative, equitable, and inclusive. Consistent with that, we made two different presentations to you to give you an update on the March 10th meeting and the August 11th board meeting, we had several interactive sessions with different focus groups and created a website. 
And also, to be totally transparent, we'd like to share that the same presentation that we are sharing with you tonight has been shared with the MyPass Executive Oversight Committee, consisting of board chair and vice chair, and to the county council at their regularly scheduled meeting today. So tonight we have a senior vice president of K-12 strategy from the Canon Design, Mr. Paul Mills, who will share with you the phase one recommendations that Canon Design is making. So with that, Paul, the screen is yours. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Board Chair Kazi, Vice Chair Hen, Mr. Um, Muhamusa, uh, Dr. Williams, and members of the board, it really is a pleasure to have the opportunity to present to you. I've been working with stakeholders in your organization that you lead, um, and it's, it's really a proud moment for me to um, stand before you and show some incremental recommendations at the midpoint of this process. A little bit about me, I'm going to get through quickly here. Um, I'm passionate about public education. I've been working in K-12 institutions for 25 years, doing projects just like this um, in terms of facilitating strategic planning, doing facilities master plans, um, conducting and leading facility assessment studies just like you've hired Canon Design to do. And I'm passionate about the institution of public education and having equitable solutions and outcomes um, for all students. The name of the project, Multi-Year Improvement Plan for All Schools, really speaks to the intentionality of this process in that it is for, indeed for all schools and all students leading the charge with equity for all. I'm joined with Dr. Lever, who is no, um, is not unfamiliar to Baltimore County. He worked with the state um, IAC for 13 years, was a facilities director at a few um, different Maryland school systems and has been a consultant with school systems. He's a, I'm proud to call him a partner on this, this team and his intimate understanding of the funding structures of how school facilities get funded and built has been instrumental to the success of this process and adds a degree of credibility to our work that is unmatched. Just a bit about our company so you understand where I'm coming from and, and the background of the, the people that are supporting you. Um, I lead a national team of K-12 designers and planners um, from around the country. And we're highly ranked nationally and we have a lot of relevant projects to bring to bear, but we're not just national. I'm zooming into you from New Hampshire where I live, but we have a longstanding um, proud office of 35 folks in the greater Baltimore area that have been supporting this project. And we've worked with several school systems around the state on many relevant projects to yours. Those like those um, described here that are relevant in terms of the scale, scope, and proximity to your school system, this project was right up our alley. So here's the agenda for tonight. And my pledge is to get at this late hour through it rather quickly. We'll give you a quick reset and overview of what you've been presented before on the intent of the My Pass. And I'll jump right into the findings. And that begins with the notion of data driven benchmarking, comparing the relative needs of all of your high school campuses. Then we'll speak to the dollars and cents, the findings of the assessment in terms of actionable project scopes that can be done and followed up um, with specific recommendations for your ongoing capital improvement program funding requests. So the purpose of the My Pass, really at the end of the day, the work product is to support the definition and prioritization of your capital improvement program. So that's all the design and construction that happens to build, add on to, and renovate your existing facilities. Um, but really through the lens of allocating resources and investments equitably, true to the name of multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Secondarily to that is the notion that um, because of the funding structures in the state of Maryland, there is participation from your county government, but also from the state. And we want to find opportunities everywhere we can to leverage those incentives 
so that we can bring more and more benefits to all of your educators and students. There's, you're gonna hear the term three pillars of analysis that are done. And we know that some of these have been done incrementally at specific points in um, the past, but this is the first time that comprehensively all of these studies are being updated and confirmed all at the same time and used to inform decision-making um, in a concerted effort. And these three pillars we'll get into in more depth in a little bit. Um, really importantly, is to, as Pete was mentioning, this is done not in a smoke-filled room, but rather transparently with active participation of stakeholders. And we're proud, despite the challenges that coronavirus has, has thrown our way, we've been successful in maintaining progress on schedule through this process with a, um, a respectable degree of outreach with, and participation of stakeholders, which we aim to continue through the balance of this process. So what's our role? We're, we're doing the facility assessment work. We're facilitating the planning, coming up with recommendations. At the end of the day, what this is about is being impartial, unbiased, and professional recommendations that come from a third party. This is my work, this is what I do, and I can assert to you professionally that no one within your system, no staff member, community member, board member, no one has influenced or fed outcomes to me. The recommendations are canon designs, objectively and professionally presented to you that are completely unbiased from the professional perspective of doing this sort of work nationwide. So here's where we are in the process. We're kind of at the midpoint here. And by design, this contract was set up with two phases, knowing that at the midpoint of this process, we would be co coinciding with your annual funding requests that you're in the middle of right now, um, focusing on high schools as your next phase of critical investments that need to be made. So at this step, we're providing these incremental recommendations for this funding cycle, but we're doing it within the framework of a long range structure and strategy for investments that would transcend this current year on into the future. So what does this mean? At the end of the day, we're still gonna be around for a um, good part of a year working with the schools. We actually have teams of architects and engineers doing the assessments right now in the balance of your facilities, your middle schools, elementary schools, non-educational facilities, et cetera. And um, the dust isn't settled, no decisions are final, but these are our initial recommendations. So we've had certain schedule considerations. I mentioned one earlier, coronavirus. We got notice to proceed in this project right when the, the pandemic started. And certainly we had to adjust our work plan on how we would approach this sort of work. Um, and we uh, working very collaboratively with county government and with Baltimore County Public Schools staff came up with an, an alternate mode to transfer into virtual workshops and to conduct a community survey that we're proud to report. There's over 22,000 responses. And in my career, having worked with 30 of your peer districts around the country, as well as entire states where I've done planning, I've never gotten this level of, of community response to a survey like you've achieved. And that's really hats off to Elisa and to Dory and those that have contributed mightily to bringing out the voices of your stakeholders into this process. I'm really proud of the fact we had 2,500 students and we aim in future generations um, throughout this process to up that, that um, stat as well. So benchmarking. The first aspect of this is coming up with a consistent way of, of using measures. We call it kind of a common yardstick to measure facilities and it's really through the lens of equity at the end of the day. So I mentioned the three pillars and here's what they are in turn. The very first one is an assessment of your facilities in terms of educational adequacy and equity. Well, what does that mean? It really speaks to how your buildings are designed, how they're equipped, how well suited the built environment is to the educational program that it houses. The second of these is the facility condition, which as the name would imply is just the really the physical health of the buildings all of the physical, all the systems that um, compose it. And we have teams of architects and engineers that do nothing but this sort of work 
that observe all of your, your facilities, looking what we like to call from fence line to fence line, from the foundation up to the rooftop, looking a thorough check in terms of the um, uh, physical health of your buildings. Third, and you might be familiar with the stage study of a couple of years ago that looked at high school's capacity. We did an update of that process and um, looked at current enrollment projections, made modifications based on the district's um, strategies for adjusting some programs such as um, bringing and building your English or speakers of other languages programs at the home high schools. And we've re-upped those. So we have these three pillars that build up a measure and an instrument with kind of for all the educators. I know many of you have dedicated your careers to teaching and, and leading school systems. You know, having a scoring rubric of sorts is you know, no stranger to that. And that's certainly the aspect and the way we do it. What this does is at the end of the day, it creates an instrument that is an equitable common yardstick to measure the relative needs that are out there. And what that means is it's really equity on the terms that Baltimore County expresses that the greater the needs, the higher the priority. So that the access to resources surfaces on the shorter end of the planning horizon, um, whereas those with less needs towards the back. So let's walk through each of these three assessments in turn. Start, starting with the educational adequacy and equity. Um, this is a framework and rubric that we've developed. That are different from others that um, work in this sort of service. Um, but it's not to say that it was a cookie cutter approach that we have imposed on Baltimore County, what I've used in New Orleans, what I've used in Los Angeles, what I've used in Oakland, Hawaii and elsewhere. Um, no. This is something that was actually worked through a diverse, broad-based stakeholder group that had the opportunity to help inform what is equity. How would we apply it into measurements for the facilities in a way that can be actionable, consistent, and um, uh, could set up, set up a data-driven approach that will improve the chances of equity with your resource allocation. So the way that this structured, and you'll see a lot of detail in the detailed support reports that will be made available to you. It's broken down into six broad categories, and beneath those 29 subcategories, there's we're calling them key performance indicators, and even beneath those, there are discrete objective observations and measurements, surveys conducted that consistently and accurately roll up into these categories that we're working with your focus group that focused on equity and educational adequacy, um, a weighting system that was built on consensus and happy to report that this committee gave a lot of great feedback on the structure of this. And they, it wasn't just about where we wait and um, put certain percentage on one category versus another, but also structural adjustments that we made to this to really make this as relevant an instrument to Baltimore County Public Schools as it can be. So I'll quickly roll through the sorts of things that this measures. Educational program down here in blue, that's kind of the no-brainer obvious, looking for the sorts of facilities, spaces, and equipment that would support the different specialized types of instruction that would happen. These are things like special ed, your pre-K programs when we get to the elementary schools, career tech, science, visual performing arts. Um, we also look at the very obvious necessities like safety and security with um, looking at ways the facility contributes towards that. Operational utility sounds kind of plain vanilla and not very interesting, but at the end of the day, to set up a sustainable um, system that can deliver um, equitably a level of quality education, that there has to be certain standards for how efficiently a, a facility can operate. And the sorts of measures that um, this looks at is the size of the campus, looks at the actual scale of the enrollment and capacity that it's at, um, the accessibility of the building, as well as some of the things like utility costs, uh, operational costs associated with it, so that at the end of the day, you have more dollars funneled into the classrooms and not spent on overhead fixed costs. Other things, technology and furniture, um, how well equipped are the facilities? 
And then things that we're really proud of um, that we feel are unique to our approach to this is looking at the wellness and what we're calling relationships and collaboration. And this is really about the social, emotional, physical supports for facilities. Does the building and its grounds, is it set up to promote healthy living, um, both mentally, socially, emotionally, as well as physically? So all the fitness and um, PE sort of aspects, uh, nutrition are covered in that space. And relationships and collaboration as architectural designers in the K-12 space around the country, um, knowing a lot about modern instruction and the way your peers are designing schools around the country, we've reversed that um, structure into how we would measure your existing facilities. And um, the source of, this is really the, the big growth area for and opportunities for your existing facilities and, and actionable changes would be in the space of creating the sorts of environments that foster collaborative learning, team teaching, project-based learning, individualized and um, approaches to education that has been growing tremendously within your system and around the country. So we have this instrument to measure educational adequacy and equity of your facilities. And using that weighted consistent scoring rubric, we applied that to all 24 of your high schools, resulting in this force ranked order. Now, looking at the scores in and of themselves, it doesn't necessarily mean much other than we know that the ones towards the top have more needs than those towards the bottom. But then when you peel back and look at all the sub scores beneath all those, you can see the relative strengths and weaknesses of each campus. And each high school has a different set of needs. So you'll see the relative spread of um, you know, the color coding here to con visually convey the areas of need versus the areas of strength. And towards the top, you would, as you would intuit, you'd see a little more of the red dots towards the bottom, more of the green dots along the way, and see how the scores are, are built up. Um, on the left-hand side is kind of a thumbnail of the detailed report, which shows all the math, how this thing is weighted, how all of the measurements were applied to come up with these scores so that the transparency that you demand is there so that you can understand how these measurements um, came across. Facility condition. This one's a little more structured and engineered because it's an industry standard approach um, called Uniformat, the breakdown of all the physical um, infrastructure of your buildings and how it breaks down into all the various types of systems and components that the buildings are made up of. And what this does at the end of the day um, creates a benchmarking instrument similar to the scores we just had for adequacy. Um, it's a metric called the facility condition index, which in many regards you can consider in your mind a proportion of how broken the, the building is would be the collection of all the repair costs divided into the cost of repairing all those systems at the same time. So it really gives you kind of a proportion of how broken in terms of the dollars you would spend um, that the facilities physically exist in. Um, it's not just a snapshot of today. Our, our folks are highly trained in this space and do nothing but assessments. And they actually forecast out to a planning horizon. And we use a consistent seven-year planning horizon for this entire project. So they're looking at the life cycles of your existing systems, working hand in glove with all the people that are um, charged with maintaining and operating your systems for this assessment. Um, so the weeding of this isn't kind of a consensus-based approach like we did with your focus group on in adequacy and equity, but rather it is cost-driven. So a dollar of expense for a roof versus a dollar of expense for a boiler, that would determine the sort of relative weighting of the various systems. So similar to the other one, this is backed and validated by a specialized focus group of peers and subject matter experts from within the system as well as external stakeholders. So similar to educational adequacy and equity, there is a force ranking of the FCI. Um, this is really an inverse function of that. We're normally FCI, the lower the number, the better the condition, but we just reversed it on a 100 point scale and came up with this breakdown. So we, you can see that the needs vary from those from the other things. Like we said before, different schools have different relative needs. Um, one thing I'd point out, there are no red dots on the aggregate scores here. And there are some with discrete systems on different schools, but what this data tells me, and it made me smile when I first saw it, and there's another metric we'll look at in a moment, but it's just 
an indicator that you're doing a fantastic job of funding and maintaining your buildings. Um, the upkeep here is, is superb. Just like in the educational adequacy, we have detailed reports that show with all the photographs and notes taken in the field um, and all the sorts of cost metrics and everything applied to the facility assessment, to your heart's content, any stakeholder can go in and see transparently how all of these numbers were derived. So that brings us to our third pillar of capacity utilization. And this is something you're likely familiar with you've been on the board since the SAGE study. But um, to refresh your memories, the utilization really is a measure of how full a building is. And it's the math really breaks down the number of students by the number of seats, right? So 100% utilized means you're comfortably full and you're operating where the building is ideally designed. You fall beneath that, you're underutilized and it's not as efficient and you're above that, you get into crowded situations, which is more of the camp that we're experiencing here in Baltimore County. I would attribute a lot of that to the successful educational program that you're delivering. Um, so the state rated capacity is a very structured formulaic approach that the entire state abides by, and there's a process for updating it, as you're aware, over time. But working closely with staff on the enrollment projections on a seven-year planning horizon, uh, we, being in that business, and I've worked with demographers all over the country, I'm very familiar with methodologies, and I can attest as a professional that your staff is doing fantastic work and that their methodologies are industry standard. They, they are approaching it the way we would, and you can comfortably rely upon the data that they are projecting out. I mentioned earlier the, um, the ESOL programs. We did make adjustments in the projected enrollments from a moving proportion of students from the school where they work operating in ESOL regional programs back to their home schools for default planning based on not wanting to look in the rear view mirror for planning, knowing that Dr. Williams and his team are rolling out um, uh, a new program to bring back ESOL programs, not just from regional centers, but back home to more of the um, home schools at the high school level and I believe the middle school level as well. All of that to say, we're being as conscientious and intentional as we can to make sure that the targets that we're shooting for, for major capital investments are as accurate as possible. So the picture tells a thousand words here. Um, as you can intuit, the color coding of the dots and the regions represent the utilization here in brackets. So the red is where you're in what we would term kind of a severe overutilization scenario on the seven year planning horizon. Orange, you are full and getting crowded um, with white in the background is you're operating and projected to be less than the built capacity of the facility, which is great news. And blue would be facilities that are beneath even 85% of that, which you don't have any capacity issues other than perhaps efficiency of operation at um, just a handful of schools. Now, the, the biggest areas of need at the high school level of this entire process, I can insert for you, is capacity utilization. With this degree of red dots on the page and being bordered by areas where there is not surplus capacity to be had is a call to action. Um, it is reaching a point of being very acute, particularly down in the southeast, but also into the northeast and your southerly part of central. Um, it is something to be dealt with in the very short order. Uh, one thing that was consistently brought up in the focus group advising and guiding the work that we've done is that while we have different categories and one of them has the name equity in it, that capacity is an equity issue. When you reach a point of some schools that are approaching 145% utilized at Dundalk, 136 at Sparrows Point, 138 at Towson within a seven year time frame, that gives pause. So this dashboard, you see a link here. Um, you can QR it with your device if you care to, but um, this is here for your convenience. We'll be loading more information on there as well. Um, as it becomes available to you. But the way to read this is it's just more granular breakdown of the sort of data that was on the map. 
the top half of the page, we've got the aggregate sums of the regions. That would be adding up all the enrollments of the schools within a region, dividing it into adding up all of the state rated capacity at those schools and dividing it or each discrete schools. You can see there's um, the last year was the baseline that we used and we projected seven years out to the 2026. So that's the relative percentage of the capacity. On the right hand side is the subtraction or basically winds up being the, the magnitude of either surplus or shortage of capacity. So as the color coding would connote and what jumps off the page or where you have the darker, more bright, orangish bordering on red colors here, but in Southeast, short over a thousand, over 1100 students within seven years, uh, about half that in the Northeast and Central, half that again, quite a bit of, of shortage of capacity needs in those particular regions. So we did a benchmarking consistent with the framework that we've built for adequacy and for condition. Um, the way the math works here is rather simple. If you're 100% utilized or less, then you have a perfect 100 point scale. And for every percentage point over 100%, um, you're deemed one point off of the, the score. So doing the math here, Dundalk and Sellers Point is the most acute projected utilization. The 145%, you subtract that extra 45% from your 100 point basis, that gives you your 55. So you can kind of see what the projected enrollment um, or the capacity utilization would be for any of these particular schools. So, okay, so tying this all together, um, and we mentioned the survey for which you'll see some results very soon in report format, but we've already taken value from that and informed some of our early recommendations um, into the process. Fundamental to that was the relative weights and values placed by your 22,000 stakeholders. That I'm proud to say represent every single one of your schools um, in nine different languages, including all the students that we mentioned. And that, pretty close to even one third, one third, one third split, but there was a preference by your, your community to lean a little bit heavier weight on educational adequacy and equity, a little bit less on facility condition and basically on one third par with capacity utilization. This is kind of what we predicted um, to be relatively split because all of these things are critically important, but we did want to not just invent something, but make, some, make sure something was validated by the voice of your community. So what all this does is using those weights and applying it to the scoring system that we mentioned to you before, on the far right in orange, we have a ranking in the aggregate score associated with all of your 24 high schools in their order. So how is this gonna be used? Well, a number of ways. First of all, having this sort of data helps us really define what the sorts of outcomes and remedies to deficient conditions can um, be proposed. Also, it helps define your renovation project scopes by gap analysis, an example of that. Having within that um, adequacy and equity rubric, having specific scores for your career tech programs, for STEM um, labs and those sorts of things. By looking at what the standards show that you ought to have in the facility versus what is actually existing, we know that we, need, we can hand off to our cost estimators and in turn budget for you what would be a responsible way to plan for either additions or renovations to retrofit in some additional facilities to support those programs. Like I said before, the greater the needs, the higher the priority that goes in terms of not just the ranking and sequencing of when the projects might happen, but also in terms of what sorts of scope would wind up in those sorts of projects. So the assessment findings. Fine and good, we have some scores. We know a relative measure of need that exists out there, a sequence of when projects could be objectively done through a lens of equity, but how is that actionable? How do I plan for it and budget for it? Well, that's part of our scope as well. So at this midpoint check-in where we're giving you a, a kind of an early findings of where we are with your high schools that will be followed up with the balance of your portfolio. 
Um, we're here to report a big gory number that starts with the letter B, um, but the high school needs total north of $1.2 billion of need within a seven year capital time frame. The relative even split between the three pillars of the study. Now a couple points about this. We're not done yet. These needs are for your high schools only. It's a seven year forecast of your needs as they evolve. It includes, this is the high end for some remedies that we've um, looked at in our recommendations. Um, potential relief schools, and the word potential is very important there. We're not prescribing the final answer on all your high schools today, but the potential of some relief schools to deal with some of the capacity issues that we showed on the map earlier, um, the costs are included in this number. There are some other remedies like additions or a hybrid of both where some of those numbers might come down a little bit. It does not include the cost of land procurement, which is something at this early stage, not knowing necessarily where things are gonna be um, uh, that we'll discover over the course of the balance of the project. It's just too early to call that at this point. Hopefully there will be some cost neutral options out there with interagency swaps or those sorts of sharing potentials um, to make the, the capital cost not as high. schools wholesale for the sake of replacing them. So let's compare that. We know we have a lot of need out there. It's measured. We have a sense of categorical breakdown of it. How does that compare to what your means are, your, your budgets? Well, typically, the county and state together put, put up $140 million a year. About $100 million of that comes from your county government. And the balance of that is going through the funding process um, to get the matching monies that we can from the state of about 40 million. Now, very intentionally visually here, we're trying to convey the relative needs on the pie chart with these gray circles that are up here. So your annual CIP budget for all schools is 140 million. Now, the high schools represent about a third of your square feet in your portfolio. And we're not done yet, so we'll soon know where we are with middle schools, elementary and others. Um, but Using a third as kind of a benchmark, if the relative needs extrapolate out um, proportionally to your high schools, that would be the size and would represent kind of a 127th of your overall high school needs. So it would take 27 years of your current level of funding, assuming that the construction costs in your budgets kind of go up at the same proportional clip over time. It would take that long, 27 years. Now, we do know that there's potential good news out there with House Bill 1, the Built to Learn Act, that um, is um, going through the legislative cycle and processes, has been discussed and has had its own, um, its own history. But that, but that potentially could amount to another $110 million per year, which would require your county government and you as taxpayers to dig a little deeper in your own pockets as well as your proportion of the state spending to put towards it. But I'm here to tell you that kind of additional spending could be transformational for your campuses. That takes, in order to take all of that 1.2 billion of need and amortize it over 27 years, that suddenly gets from a daunting number that feels like never to 15 years you can get your head around. That could be something very exciting. Now a point here on, we're talking about economy talking about your budgets and your means versus your needs that are out there. Anytime you take the discretion of making a major investment on a single campus, something like a hundred million dollar plus replacement for the sake of replacing a facility delays all other projects of the peer schools to that one campus by about two to three years for each one of those. So this speaks to the need to prioritize, right? We know that we have a lot of need and limited resources. So we built um, on all of those $1.2 billion and all the various needs and costs that have been cost estimated out there, we've applied it through a consistent methodology of categorization or prioritization. And we kind of called them priorities one through five. The stuff at the top, priority one, these are the things, health, life, safety, code compliance, stuff where people could get hurt. The building could um, be in, in really poor shape if something wasn't done. And I put into that your acute capacity shortage 
um, bracket as well. Going down the way, we get into stuff that's just as critical, but it's just a matter of degrees at this point. All priorities one through five are important to be done. When you start reading from the bottom up, looking at things like refreshing your furniture with more modern equipment that um, really can improve the learning environment and facilitate project-based learning, the sorts of behaviors that um, happen in your classrooms today. That's priority five, that's down towards the bottom. Um, priority four, these are things, we're talking about the arts and athletics. These are things that contribute towards social emotional well-being, et cetera. These are very important items. They're down priority four. So digging deep into your priorities was a very difficult thing to do. The bar chart here shows these costs spread out over the sorts of priorities and it's coded by the three pillars. And this made me smile again. Remember I mentioned earlier, no red dots on the page for facility condition. Well, you have a, a minuscule $9 million sounds like a lot, but it's really not for capital planning for a school system of 170 schools. What this tells me, the data says you are doing a fantastic job of maintaining your existing facilities. You're budgeting for them, making those investments and the professionals that are charged with maintaining them are doing a superb job and they should be applauded for the great work that they're doing. On the capacity side, like I said, this is the DNA of my high school recommendations to you is we got to take care of this big looming capacity crunch that's out there. I had to split it in half into parties one to actually into thirds here, one, two, and three to find out ways we can stage it over time. And we'll just start to get into recommendations um, and how we might accomplish that. So first and foremost, keep doing what you're doing well. You do the systemic repair programs that you've been funding and cyclically doing. Use the tools that we've um, delivered to you with the facility condition assessment for predictive modeling of when repairs need to happen, how budgeting can happen. And this can be staged in perpetuity over time. Every single facility plan I've ever done comes in the middle of, or there's projects in, in mid course that are already underway when the project started. You have a number of elementary school projects, middle school projects, and you do have one major high school project at Lansdowne that you've already invested um, capital money into the design and it's uh, mid course of the design efforts on that project right now. And our recommendation is finish what you started. Um, carry on with Lansdowne, let's get that one done. After we call that group one, group two, let's, like I said, we really need to, to it's reaching a boiling point on capacity. Please um, uh, consider the recommendation to quickly launch some kind of no brainer facility additions that can be done in the very short term that would be relevant in just about every planning scenario we could come up with so that we can do some relief while we responsibly look at some other alternatives where we need to engage stakeholders more and look at due diligence for land uh, procurement options out there. So these four schools that um, under our recommendations would be launched for additions in the near term would be Dundalk, Towson, Lock Raven, and Patapsco. So staggered off by about a year's time frame, we're calling group three. These would be those priority two of your capacity issues out there. But that lag of time, you, you can't spend it all in year one. So it, you, the capital funding will be there um, with the right amount of time, but be very deliberate about that time to do the sort of stakeholder engagement and land due diligence to consider alternatives that might have new campuses in them, or you could continue to grow and have a second round of additions on facilities or some sort of hybrid thereof. Here are the ones, the schools that are affected that we're recommending that if you look from left to right, you kind of have mutually exclusive scenarios that can be done. You have kind of a lower cost one and a higher cost one in both of these. One focuses on the Northeast, one focuses on um, the Southeast down in Sparrows Point. And I'll, let me point out some of the nuances of them. The B, the expensive categories represent a new school, a new facility. So one B would be a new high school to be named in the future that would relieve your area, um, uh, high schools in the area that are crowded and projected to, to continue to grow. Or that you would have additions at Perry Hall, Overly and Kenwood that would offset those. 
It's similar in the southeast with Sparrows Point, but it does have a unique facet that needs to be brought to bear. Um, uh, we know that there's a unique situation at Sparrows Point where one campus houses both the middle school and high school programs, which presents, in addition to some educational opportunities in terms of vertical alignment of curriculum, it also presents a lot of operational challenges with social emotional issues, behavioral issues, et cetera, on a crowded site where you have um, 12 uh, year olds running around with 18 year olds on the same campus. And we looked at this as an opportunity because it's projected to be over 130% utilized within the planning horizon. Perhaps we find a new home for the middle school on a separate campus, allowing the high school to commandeer those spaces with a major renovation to make those spaces suitable for a very exciting new high school program there. And meanwhile, the middle school um, has a new home as well. In order to do these things, we didn't feel in during coronavirus with limited access to stakeholders and community, it's a rush decision to do these. Hence, we've created this framework and structure with a lag time so that over the balance of the my pass or into future, if, if um, it extends beyond that, that these things can be done in a way that's um, responsible to your communities and listens to their voice so they can weigh in on the sorts of programs and what their the goals need to be for those particular schools. What about the rest of the schools? Um, we've talked about a handful of them in areas that have the capacity issues. Well, the rest of them, the good news is we're not ignoring them by any stretch at all, but we consider them the next tier of priority after we take care of that backlog of capacity issues that needs to be dealt with. And what we're recommending is that develop a renovation cycle strategy that's form fitted to your expected budgets and a reasonable time frame to get the work executed. Something in the 15 year sort of range and not the 27 sort of year range that we were looking at earlier. So with that kind of strategy in mind, we looked at three potential um, sorts of cases that could build out of it. Case one, House Bill one passes. Um, could be transformational, not just for Baltimore County schools, but the entire state. And we mentioned that earlier as a potentiality. By doing this, all five tiers of priority, which gets into some really exciting stuff. Um, I know that it sounds particularly if there's an expectation of a brand spanking new facility after tearing the old one down, um, might sound like a concession, but I'm here to tell you this sort of investments and what we've programmed in here would be large renovation projects with a scope that would leave people very excited about the new environment that the that the education would be happening in and would not be a very tremendous um, uh, concession to, to have. This would be kind of the magic case with House Bill 1. Within a reasonable time frame, you address all five tiers of priority. Okay, House Bill 1, we're, going, we're going into a recession. This might be a tough order, or maybe there's a smaller magnitude of it, so it might be somewhere in between. But in the case where there's no House Bill 1 and you're living within your current means of 140 million a year, then what we would recommend, there's really kind of case two and case three, um, case two being kind of a re reduced scope. You ratchet back the priorities of spending invested in each of your facilities equitably um, so that you deliver, let's say priorities one and two, maybe some of three, you get into the two and a half sort of range of priorities at each campus along a consistent time frame where every campus does benefit from capital improvements over a reasonable time frame. Or the other case, which we're not recommending, would be the no House Bill 1 scenario, but digging in and going, doing one school at a time every few years and dealing with all priorities one through five. What this does is it forces out schools that will not receive um, major renovation projects until decades away. When you start looking at the tail end of this cycle year 2050, it really brings home just kind of the impact of what the constraints of your budgets would um, limit you to if you're wanting to do all the improvements one at a time at each campus. Which brings us to a close here. What are incremental snapshot for this year recommendations on your CIP request are these. First of all, Fund and implement your systemic repairs just as you always do in a very good fashion. 
um, let's get on with what we started with your group one project and then get group two uh, addition projects coupled with some renovations on um, those group two schools in this year's cycle so that those can get underway. Two, to initiate the stakeholder outreach and land due diligence that I mentioned earlier, um, consistent and concurrent with this process for the balance of the My I Pass in a way that can inform which path you want to take in terms of relieving the balance of the capacity issues down in the southeast and northeast. And three, advocate for that House Bill 1. Let's get that Built to Learn Act so we can have those transformational case one scenarios digging down priorities one through five for all schools within a reasonable time frame. So that concludes the presentation component of this. I know I've, I'd like to talk and is rather long-winded. I hope I wasn't on mute this whole time. And <laughs> I hope that um, uh, we have some great questions and dialogue. So thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And <clears throat> I do encourage everyone to go back in and look at the, um, the data that is going to be available um, through their um, dashboard. And um, I appreciate Mr. Dixit, including Ms. Hen and I in the executive oversight uh, committee. However, it was truly the county that did the heavy lift, uh, developing the RFP, uh, the managing the bid, the selection process. Um, and uh, Mr. Blades, we need to uh, thank him and um, Ms. Stacey uh, Rogers for all the coordination that happened uh, with along with our BCPS staff. Um, board members, we will go around the dais, and uh, if you want to make a comment and ask questions, um, we will have another session on this at the next meeting. Um, so if you can ask questions, if there's a short answer, that's great, but if not, um, those answers can be provided at a later date. Uh, so we will start then on the other side of the room with uh, Ms. Rowe. Hi, yes. So one of the things I'm concerned about is that the state IAC is about to award a contract to create a facilities index score such as what you've created for the county for the entire state. And that that facilities index score that they create may change the recommendations that you're recommending. And I have concerns that if we pursue renovation projects and then their funding formulas change, we could put ourselves in a position to where a renovation may not have been the right course of action. Um, and I'm concerned that until we know and until that contract has been fully executed, which they're estimating will take a year before they have solid results, I'm concerned that their work might make this work obsolete. And I'm also concerned about the fact that the way our county laws are set up, developers can use any plan the school system creates to justify development in areas already overcrowded. So once we create this plan, then the overcrowding solution is overcrowded the day it opens because there is no restriction on development in Baltimore County based on school capacity. So I, I'm wondering if you have a way to mitigate those things. Um, thank you, Board Member Rowe. Great question. Um, as always, the, um, the IAC's assessment, we we know that that's not under contract yet. It's actually under protest, and it's been under protest for a few years. Um, the methodologies could differ subtly, but I'm I'm sure that their professionals will, um, you know, provide similar sorts of findings that our professionals have provided in measures. But the good news is, is that Baltimore County's is half done and will be shortly completely done, and decisions can be made and, and move forward. Um, I would comment also about that. The early recommendations we're saying specifically for high schools are that we're focusing on capacity in the near term years, less so than on the renovations that they would follow suit shortly thereafter, but it does create a bit of time. So if there were different findings that were found out there, 
those can be reconciled um, and perhaps adjustments could be made to the plans that we're doing. But we stand behind our data. It's, it's um, consistently um, uh, recorded and measured and we have a great track record with your peers around the country doing this sort of work. Relative to the cap on, on development and those sorts of things, it's really a, a governance issue relative to statute. And we do know that some of your neighboring counties do have harder caps on development, and that would be a policy sort of choice that um, could be in discussion in your in your county government. So do you know if the state IAC work that they're doing, if they are weighting the three pillars in similar fashion to the way we're weighting them, or are they weighting them differently? Um, I'm not sure certain what they're doing. Um, I, my familiarity with it stops at, I do know that they're doing an assessment in this study and it does look at aspects of education in addition to um, conditions similar to this. Whether it's similar or dissimilar to this, I can't imagine it's a facsimile because um, um, I do know we are not subject to winning that project, but um, we're not also subject to protesting either. But um, uh, that there are some disputes going on among other vendors that are out there. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely, great question. And it, and um, that is a, an item that could be followed up with in terms of uh, board members receiving a, a link to the IAC reports um, that relate to uh, the plans that they have even though they are currently disrupted. And um, Ms. Scott. Um, thank you for that, Ms. Collins. And that was my question I was gonna ask. The report, I guess, that you mentioned, is that in our board docs? Or I, I didn't see that anywhere. Is that something that'll be sent later to the board? Uh, it's my understanding that will be provided to you um, through normal channels. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. That is a good question. And yes, the um, the anticipation is to have this linked to board docs um, after the meeting. And then also the um, website, I understand, is going to be made public. I believe it's uh, tomorrow. Is that correct, Mr. Mills? Um, that's what I heard from staff, but I would defer to, um, to Pete and Ed about some of the logistics on that. Mr. Dixit, can you confirm when the uh, presentation is going to be publicly available? My understanding is that the presentation is going to be publicly available right after the board meeting sometime. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Mack? Um, I have no questions, but I did wanna thank you for that very thorough um, presentation. Um, I found it very interesting and informative, so thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Mr. Mills, my name is Rod McMillian, and I represent Councilmatic District 7, which is the southeast area. We have in the southeast area three of the top five high schools, Dundalk, Ferris Point, and Patapsco, with the most need. Are you aware there is a 28-acre site, former junior high school site, at the corner of Wise Avenue and Merritt Boulevard? How can you and I initiate a feasibility study to determine the impact a new high school in this site would have on the overcrowding at Dundalk, Ferris Point, Patapsco? Is this something Cannon can analyze? Um, can, absolutely and um, would be happy to learn more about the specific site and the circumstances behind it. But um, any sort of information that's out there that you or other stakeholders are aware of that could potentially help um, the cause for this planning would invite with open arms. Thank you, sir. So Mr. Miles, uh, the Mills, so, you, so I can reach out to you directly? Um, uh, with the discretion of Pete Dixit and Ed Blades, absolutely. And I would certainly go through proper protocols, but would um, happily receive that call. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jones?
Thank you. First of all, thank you, Mr. Mills, Mr. Dixit, and the team for this report. Um, this kind of detailed multi-year plan is something that I had been waiting for, especially one that is quite well done. Um, there was a strong need in Baltimore County Public Schools for an objective, transparent process that everyone could understand and buy into, and I think you've done a great job. Um, I also want to state that the facility condition index that you're using is a key performance indicator for benchmarking and it is an industry standard. Uh, to go back to Ms. Rose's question, wouldn't that be something that the state would be using as well? Um, I, I presume so, that they would have some sort of subcomponent of their rubric similar to this where there is an FCI. Um, I've seen rare cases where school systems or other governmental agencies will have some variants from that, but it's a rather consistent metric that's out there. Okay, thank you. And you are going to be adding the middle schools to this study as well. Absolutely. We're at a midpoint here, and by design, um, because of your funding cycles, we're presenting the high school findings at this midpoint, but we'll be around for several more months. Okay, and there'll be more questions. So thank you, good job, and good night. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Mr. Mills. I just wanted to thank you again and reiterate um, what a wonderful job you did on your presentation. I enjoyed it the second time around even more than the first this morning, and I appreciate you delivering it to the board at this late hour. So I have no questions at this time, but I thank you for joining us this evening and look forward to our work session. So thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Mr. Mahamza. I have no comments. Mr. Offerman? I, I, uh, I have no, uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Ms. Pesture? Uh, thank you. Mr. Mills, uh, bravo, a wonderful, uh, job, uh, that was done here. Um, as has already been said, um, very um, thorough. Uh, you, you, you dug deeply to, to prioritize on different levels, and I appreciate that. Uh, I, however, and the however is not to you, Mr. Mills, it's to the board, to the superintendent, um, to, Ms., uh, to Dr. Scriven. I cannot let this moment go by but without saying that in the conversation about equity, if you take a look at that sheet, it's almost like there's not a west side of Baltimore County. And I know you will get to the middle schools, um, elementary schools we will look at. And again, Mr. Mills, no, I said this um, when the equity group met. And thank you, uh, Mr. Dixit, for having me on that. Um, I, I enjoyed being on that immensely. But again, I say I felt like there was no west side of Baltimore County. I will never, I will be the last bastion. I, I applaud all of those parents and elected officials from the east side of Baltimore County who always come out, come out in droves to advocate for their schools. Yes, I wish from the bottom of my heart that we could have those numbers coming out for the schools on the west side that are in sore need and, I, and, and need on all of those levels about which Mr. Mills spoke this evening. So we don't teach our children based on which parents come to uh, PTA or which people come out to advocate for the schools. We take care of all of our children. So I will be the one who's going to do that with my last ounce of breath, whether I'm on the school board or not. So school board, Dr. Williams, Dr. Scriven, I am happy to see Bedford moving forward. Summit Park moving forward. But my heart is still broken. And thank you, Miss. Um, Causey for inviting me to go to Campfield and talking about Millbrook and Scott's Branch, because what we are doing 
is ingraining in the being of our children a notion of being less than. So when you go to schools, facilities that are not up to par in all of the many ways that Mr. Mills so beautifully pointed out tonight. And then they go to their middle schools that are in need in terms of facilities. Then they go to the high schools that were on that list, down on that list somewhere. And then when they can see and their parents can see and the community can see those numbers about school, about scores, and then you add all of that up. And what does that make the children believe they are or who they are? And we can tell them that they are just as good and that they matter just like everyone else matters. But it is hard to do that. I'm going to preach this till the bitter end. So I'm saying to the system, pay attention. Let's pay attention to everything that Mr. Mills' report said. Because we must apply that, not just to the physical, the piece that's about need as well, is also about what we do to a child's psyche, what we say to them in terms of who they are and how important they are. So you know what, Mr. Mills, thank you again. Thank you again and again and again, because you laid it out so well, so well, that you have given us benchmarks that we need to use. And I feel this so passionately, and I will not give up on this. And I don't care how many studies there are, and I don't care how many schools are up at the top and we're still at the bottom. There's an east side and a west side, a southeast, a southwest, et cetera, et cetera. And I want all of our children to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Mr. Kuhn? As normal, it's tough to follow Cheryl, but I'll try. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mills, uh, for your presentation. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of data and information here. Uh, unfortunately, the board hasn't seen the entire report and everything behind what you just presented. So I look forward to diving into that. One of the things that I wanted to ask about um, uh, had to do with the idea behind building um, additions instead of replacing schools. I don't know if you can quickly perhaps give us an answer about that because I, I didn't really see any new high schools out there um, except uh, possibly one in the Southeast. So I, I was curious as to how that was arrived at. Sure, um, so the notion, the question to make sure I'm, I'm tracking with you, um, did we consider replacement of existing facilities on the same sites as a remedy for some air capacity issues? Um, we did look at that as a potentiality, and there are three points that really made that challenging. One, and the foremost thing, is just it's very expensive to do that sort of new construction work, and considering limited budgets, hard to justify considering the timelines that investing in a major expense like tearing down capacity that you sorely need and replacing it perhaps incrementally larger um, was hard to justify those costs considering all the needs of all the, the schools in the system. Um, second of all, the, the metrics, the FCI, when you look at the economics of it, it's not financially justified by the data to take down your buildings and replace them. There's still life left in them. And through strategic investments, these things can last for another generation in a way that you can be proud of, that would actually be inspirational and create an environment that is very suitable for education in the future without having to tear down and start over. Well, I look forward to looking at the detail. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hager? Yes, hi, thank you again for the presentation. It was so informative. I'm gonna be sifting through my notes in the report after the meeting. Um, I have been concerned for a long time also, similar to uh, Ms. Pasteur, about the equity issue with, uh, with school building. And um, I really liked your rubric um, 
that includes the three pillars. But I did notice that Lansdowne High School was by far number one in educational adequacy and equity and by far number one in facilities and condition. But because the capacity utilization was like number five or lower down the list, rather, they ended up like number five on your priority list. Granted, it's a legacy project, so it's going to move forward as number one. But if it weren't for that, then a school that clearly is in desperate need of a new building wouldn't have gotten a new building based on the rubric. And so is there a tipping point where the conditions are just so dire that um, the rubric is thrown out the window and you say this building has got to be redone? Well, part of it is, is not relitigating past decisions uh, that are kind of past the point of no return um, in the case of Lansdowne, but kind of a rule of thumb when you look at financially, looking at the stewardship of your physical assets, there's kind of once you get north of spending half of the money it would take to replace something, particularly when you get towards a two thirds is kind of a common industry you'll see out there. You're at 65% and above. You're probably at a point now where you're driving a 19, you know, 84 Volvo. And while you've enjoyed it over the years, it might be time for a new car. <laughs> but um, when we have 22 FCIs, not 65 FCIs, and then even if you put on top of that some of the educational adequacy repairs and costs and things. Um, we didn't find any campuses that really met that threshold to where it was financially a no brainer that you ought to just start over now. survey and the stakeholder interview groups um, and I thought that you said that that played into the scheduling considerations was that accurate did I, did I hear that correctly that is there community input that goes into this rubric in some way or is that really secondary um, well the the it did weigh into the rubric in terms of the weighting and it was also um, informed and guided by the focus groups that we worked with um, through multiple sessions to design the the rubric and that was applied to come up with the sequencing and timing of projects. Okay, thank you, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, so um, Mr. Mills, I forgot to thank Dr. Lever um, and um, what a great resource for, oh, yes. us, for us to have. I was uh, had the benefit of meeting him in fall of 2015 when I started my board service and going to the IAC to understand more about the um, school construction process. Um, and he really does uh, just have a wealth of knowledge um, and a passion for for sharing it. Um, I I don't know if it's my computer or everyone's. It appears that Board Chair Cossie is frozen. I believe she is. Madam Chair. Well, Mr. Mills, I was just going to ask you what you, the next step was uh, for uh, interfacing and interacting with the board for you and your team. 
Um, I would defer to my handlers within the county government and school system. I'll try to answer that question. Yes, uh, the, the purpose of today's presentation is part of communicating the findings to everybody. And we did the same thing with county council. So our conversation will continue till we have time to make the final recommendation approved by the county council and by the school board. Yeah. Um, other activities that are on the near term horizon are completing the middle school, elementary school assessments, validating that data, um, collecting, gathering the um, educational adequacy and equity information, um, and validating, sitting in workshops, looking at all the capacity utilization. Um, we're um, in discussion of the structures for how you know, we. We um, did a very successful process to get us to our point on schedule for this first phase, but we wanted to also look at the balance of the project with a little bit more relaxed schedule and make sure that um, we structured it with the appropriate um, committee structure and outreach overlays. So we're working closely with staff on how the balance of this work will work. For the most part, it would be consistent with what we've done here with perhaps an increasing frequency and touches with stakeholders and certainly with student voice. Good evening. Can you hear me? Welcome back. Thank you. So I'm going to blame it on the weather that my internet is down. Um, so just for the, the next um, time that we're together, one of the things that is um, important and that many of our stakeholders have referenced over time when we have um, addressed our capital construction is the enrollment projections. So just as recently um, as today, I received um, information that had side-by-side -side, um, comparisons of the student counts data. And so what would be helpful to understand is the, um, the data that Canon Design used and also to do an evaluation of the accuracy of the projection enrollments and not as a function of the overall accuracy, but we're talking about the 24 high schools. Um, so if I go inside to get my report, let's see if I can do this. Um, we're talking about swings of hundreds of um, being shifted out of some schools and, and moving to other schools. So, uh, for instance, Catonsville High School, uh, the difference in the 2028 20, projection listed in February 2019 versus June of 2020 is um, an enrollment that's down by 59 students. Chesapeake High School went up by 15 students. Delaney High School went up by 66 uh, Dundalk High School went up by 314 students. Um, Franklin High School uh, went down by 201 students. So um, what really needs to be presented is the accuracy of enrollments and what are the factors that have changed the projections, um, in some cases very drastically. Uh, Newtown High School is uh, projected to be lower by 160 students in a projection from February of 2019 versus what was available in June of 2020. So, um, and also to, to another board member's point about development and developers, <clears throat> those numbers need to be really uh, looked at in terms of the county's planning process. And there is a task force and we appreciate the uh, county executive and the school system working with the county council on addressing that, um, the issues of um, developers building in areas that are overcrowded um, related to capacity being available adjacent. Um, but that's problematic if we're asking uh, 
families that have belonged to school communities for years, but then have to be redistributed out. So there's a lot of um, community concerns, and I think that it's going to be helpful for you to be able to evaluate those projections and and where the confidence level can can come from. So, um, Ms. Han, if I can just ask you, did everyone else wrap up for Mr. Mills? Madam Chair, I'm not sure. So let's, um, we should probably ask if there are any outstanding issues, comments, or questions that board members may have. Yes, and I did want to, um, to hear from Dr. Williams um, any thoughts that he would like to share. So once again, I will just associate myself with comments made by board members. Mr. Mills, appreciate your presentation and all the data. Um, and the links will be provided. And again, I just I appreciate your patience tonight um, as we were running a little bit over on our agenda. So again, thank you so much. And to our county partners, we appreciate the collaboration and partnership. Um, this has been a topic uh, when I first came, and so I appreciate our county partners, our county executive and the county council, and of course the board as we are exploring these next steps of capital improvement. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and thank you, Mr. Mills. So we are now going to move on to the next item on the agenda. which is the uh, report on the proposed school calendar. And so for that, uh, Dr. Williams, what staff do we have here for that item? That is Mr. Duke. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Duke. Good evening, Madam Chair, Chair Vice Chair Hen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm having problems with my um, internet. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. The count committee met on August 24th and August 31st to develop a calendar for the 21-22 school year. As a result of those meetings, the committee's recommendation was to provide the board with a pre and labor calendar for its consideration. Both calendars have 182 secondary students and 105 emergency closure days added at the end of the school year. Also, both calendars have a full spring break from the end of classes on April 8th through Easter Monday, April 18th, with classes resuming on Tuesday, April 19th. The key differences between the calendars are the start dates of the academic year for staff and students, as well as the end dates for the school year. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, entertain them at this time. Thank you. I see Dr. Hager. Uh, sorry, turning on my ca camera. Yes, um, thank you. It looks like others have questions too. Um, I did, uh, several of us were, were contacted by, um, by, by a constituent who noted that the date of Eid, the Muslim holiday of Eid, is actually recognized on May 2nd, and we have it recognized in our calendar as May 3rd. And I looked in to confirm this, and that is actually true. So um, I'm not sure how, how this process works for ad making adjustments to the calendar. Is this just do board members make recommendations and the calendar committee considers it? or? With regards to the holidays, uh, it's a little bit difficult with the uh, Muslim holidays. Uh, we can make a change uh, upon confirmation that indeed it is May 2nd versus May 3rd. Okay. Um, and secondly, um, the concern that should there be more than five snow days, um, that the kind of, I, think, I believe the calendar 
uh, document that you, you shared says that we would then extract holidays and spring breaks and kind of it goes on in a list. Um, but is there room to not remove holidays as kind of a first swipe, particularly religious holidays? Um, just again, considering that a religious holiday is different than a day of spring break, um, it has different meaning for many of the students in the in the county. The uh, Muslim holidays have been uh, designated on the calendar as professional development days, as well as the Jewish holidays that occur earlier in the board. However, um, in past um, deliberations has decided uh, and indicated that if we were to need to convert days um, to make up uh, for uh, school closures, that we would not convert those professional development days into student days. Okay, thank you. And then I just, um, as a as a fairly new board member, um, I, I feel very strongly about um, a, a pre Labor Day start in general, just to, to let others know. And, and I'm happy to discuss that at another time. But um, but that is something that, as a working parent and someone who believes in um, has great concerns for the achievement gaps that happen in the summer. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it was mentioned that I am uh, very much for a pre Labor Day start. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, I have a question. Um, there was a teacher who emailed me earlier today. Uh, he asked a very great question. Um, I, I sort of knew the answer, but I didn't. I wanted to follow up. He, he said he, basically what his question was, um, if we're basically uh, remain virtual during um, the winter time, um, would there be snow days technically since it's virtual? Um, no, this was discussed with the unions and uh, unless there is a uh, state declared uh, emergency and if there's uh, some sort of severe storm that would impact uh, connectivity and the ability to um, conduct remote learning, uh, we would continue to operate. And that was written into the MOU between the teachers union and the board. Okay, that's what uh, I thought it was mentioned. So that, that was my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Mr. Duke, when does this come back to the board for voting? Uh, the second reader is on October 13th, and then the um, vote uh, is scheduled for November 10th. Okay, thank you. Other board members? Ms. Causey, I have a question. Roger, Mr. Mc Mr. McMillian. Mr. Dukes, considering that we've been in virtual learning since March 16th or whatever, have you, has your committee discussed on emergency days off in the future where we go virtual rather than plan in five emergency days, those days go virtual as long as there's connectivity? Thank we you. have had preliminary discussions around that. Um, there are other considerations that need to be taken into account. Being in a virtual setting on a continual basis is much different than all of a sudden being in a virtual setting for making up instruction um, or continuing instruction. Uh, so there, I think before we can even uh, entertain that concept, uh, we need to have further discussions and further inquiry and, and consultation also with the state. So is that something that you're going to initiate? Uh, we, we can. I, I wasn't contemplating on doing that. Dr. Williams, did you want to speak to that? Yes, I think we can have further conversations with the state um, regarding just the experience with virtual learning and um, what Mr. McMillian was was inquiring about 
Um, we do take the guidance from the state, so I think we can follow up. But at this point, um, that will be an, uh, an action item. Thank you, Rod, for that suggestion, and thank you, Dr. Williams, for the uh, follow-up. Other... So the next item on the agenda, we have board members, uh, item M, report on equity, item N, board committee updates. Um, I would entertain uh, moving forward, but I would also entertain if we wanted to uh, postpone those two items to the next board meeting, given the lateness of the hour. The other how affected the accumulated years of experience? Well, this is Ms. Pasteur. Let me move to entertain your whatever to entertain your comment. I'll second Ms. Pester's motion. Uh, so there's a motion on the second to move items M and N to the next board meeting. Is there any further discussion, Ms. Joes? Uh, yes, I want to point out that this was placed really late. So if Ms. Pastor could entertain an amendment that this be placed um, further up in the agenda for next for the next board meeting and not down at the bottom, you know, at the end, because this is an important issue we're discussing equity, and I want it to be done um, in, during in the beginning and not at the end. So, would you accept an amendment to push it up front and not at the bottom of the agenda? I absolutely um, would. If there are no staff members involved tonight, I'm fine with that because I think it's important and we it should not be gobbled at this late hour. So I'm willing. Um, so to thank you, Ms. Joes, for that. that suggestion. And thank you, Ms. Pasteur, uh, for um, ac accepting it. Now we need uh, the second to agree. Is that Ms. Hen? I will agree. I had a procedural question um, about agenda setting, whether or not that's something we can stipulate as part of this motion. If Mr. Bersades is still with us at this hour. So Mr. Bersades can, Mr. Bersades can confirm for me, but it, um, uh, agenda setting is an open meetings act. So since we are in an open session, um, we should be able to process this motion. Mr. Bersades, is that correct? Yes, Ms. Kazi. And without seeing the agenda for next meeting, um, we are unable to specify specifically which item it will be. So if Ms. Joes, would it be acceptable to you to specify it as the first item of new business for the next? Yes, that sounds good. If that, okay, I would accept that. Thank you. Would you like, would you like to restate your motion? <laughs> um, that the um, equity, is it the report be presented right after uh, new business at the next board meeting? Well, wait a minute. Is it after new business or is the first item on new business? Is it, Ms. Hen, did you say after new business or the first item? And, and I could care one way or the other. I'm fine, as long as it's up front. I said it's the first item of new business, so that it's okay, so first or up front. Okay, so I move that the agenda be placed um, first item of new business. So, Ms. Joes, thank you for that. We have a motion and a second. So, uh, your motion is to amend uh, the motion to specify that the report on equity will be the first item of new business. Correct. Thank you. Okay. And um, so, 
board members with that, we will vote on the amendment. So roll call vote, please, on the amendment to uh, report on equity to be the first new business item. Dr. Hager? Yes. This is a president. It's supremacist platform and it needs to be challenged. Yes. Yes, Mr. there Hunter? is. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Salvi? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're voting on the motion as amended that we will move items M and N to the next board meeting with item M being the first item of new business. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Ruff? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The last excuse item me. on the agenda. Ms. Causey, excuse me, may I ask a question, yes. please? Certainly. Um, I'm, this is Ms. Scott. Um, I didn't see and I may have missed it, but the actual report itself attached to the um, agenda item, was that missing or will that be attached for the next meeting? Um, I didn't see the actual report there. I know we're receiving a presentation, but I wanted to know if the report was going to be in board docs. Um, Dr. Williams, would you so, like to see that? So the, the plan was to follow up from the previous board meeting with a um, presentation. So there was not a report attached to board doc. And after the presentation, we were going to attach it. So uh, we can have the presentation available for the next meeting prior to October 13th. Can we have the report attached as well or, or also included in board docs? Uh, let me uh, explore that, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So if there's no further business, the last item on the agenda is announcements. And our next board meeting is Tuesday, October 13th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Um, and there will be public comment on the 2021-2022 school calendar. Um, please look for the press release and also the news items on the website uh, for your opportunity to um, include your public comment. And uh, with that, I just want to tell everyone thank you and also take care and stay safe. The meeting is now adjourned.